Welcome to my channel, Midnight Stories, where you find horror stories that scare you. Before watching, please press like to support me in producing more stories. This helps in spreading the video and reaching more people. Thank you for your support and enjoy watching. My name's Eli Stanton, and I've lived off the grid for nearly a decade now. The dense forests of northern Maine have been my home, my sanctuary, and my escape from a world that once threatened to consume me. It wasn't always like this. There was a time when I was just another cog in the machine, a systems analyst for a big tech firm in Boston. The job paid well, but it sucked the life out of me, one pixel at a time. I still remember the day everything changed. It was a Tuesday, unremarkable in every way, until the phone call that shattered my world. My wife, Laura, had been in a car accident. By the time I made it to the hospital, she was gone. The doctor said it was instantaneous that she didn't suffer. But I suffered. I suffered because I knew that if I hadn't been so absorbed in my work, so glued to my screens, I might have been there to pick her up from her art class like I'd promised. The guilt ate at me, gnawing away at my insides until there was nothing left but a hollow shell of the man I used to be. I couldn't bear to look at another computer screen, couldn't stand the constant buzz of notifications that seemed to mock my loss. So I made a decision that some might call drastic, but to me it was the only way to preserve what was left of my sanity. I sold everything I could, gave away the rest, and used what little money I had left to buy a small run-down cabin deep in the main woods. It was miles from the nearest town, accessible only by a winding dirt road that became impassable during the harsh winter months. But that suited me just fine. I wanted isolation. I craved it. The cabin itself was nothing special when I first arrived. It was a simple log structure weathered by years of neglect, with a tin roof that leaked when it rained, and windows that rattled in the wind. But it was mine. And over the years I've poured my heart and soul into making it a home. I learned to hunt, to fish, to identify edible plants in the forest. I chopped wood for the long winters, patched the roof, and reinforced the walls. Slowly but surely, the cabin transformed, much like I did. It became sturdy, self-sufficient, a testament to survival in the face of adversity. Living alone suits me. There's a purity in nature that you don't find in city life. It's quiet, predictable. The rhythms of the forest became my heartbeat, the whisper of the wind through the pines my lullaby. I found peace in the solitude, a sense of purpose in the daily struggle for survival. But nature, I would soon learn, isn't always predictable. And sometimes the quiet hides secrets darker than any urban nightmare. It was a night like any other, or so I thought. The air was crisp with the promise of autumn, carrying the scent of pine and decay. I sat on my porch, a steaming mug of coffee in my hands, watching the sun dip below the tree line. The forest was alive with the usual evening sounds, the rustle of leaves, the call of birds settling in for the night the scurrying of small animals in the underbrush. I've grown accustomed to these sounds over the years. They're comforting in their familiarity, a reminder that life goes on, regardless of human concerns. I can identify most of the local wildlife by sound alone now, the soft hoot of a barred owl, the chatter of a red squirrel, even the distant howl of the occasional wolf pack. But as the last rays of sunlight faded, painting the sky in hues of purple and orange, I heard something different, something that made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. It started as a low, throaty rumble so deep I felt it more than heard it. At first I thought it might be distant thunder, but the sky was clear, stars just beginning to twinkle into view. Then I considered it might be a bear. We have a few up here, mostly black bears that keep to themselves, but this, this was different. The sound came again, louder this time, closer. It vibrated in my chest, set my teeth on edge. It was primal, ancient, something that spoke to a part of my brain I didn't know existed. A part that screamed danger. I stood up, my coffee forgotten, and tried to pinpoint where the sound was coming from. The forest was dense, the underbrush thick this time of year, making it hard to see much beyond the tree line. Shadows stretched long and dark, playing tricks on my eyes. The noise came a third time, and this time I was sure it was moving, getting closer. Without thinking, I retreated into the cabin, my heart pounding. I grabbed my rifle, an old Remington my father had given me years ago. 
It was a comforting weight in my hands, a connection to a past that seemed impossibly distant now. I'm not one to scare easily. You can't live out here alone if you jump at every shadow or unusual sound. But something about that noise triggered a deep-seated instinct in me, something that said this wasn't a normal animal. This was something else entirely. I stepped back onto the porch, rifle at the ready, and peered into the gathering darkness. The forest had gone eerily quiet. No birds, no insects, even the wind seemed to have died down. It was as if the whole world was holding its breath, waiting. And then I saw it, a shadow, darker than the rest, moving at the edge of the clearing. It was big, much bigger than a bear, and it moved with a fluid grace that sent chills down my spine. For a moment our eyes met across the distance. I couldn't make out any details in the fading light, but I felt its gaze lock onto me. Intelligent, calculating, hungry. And then it was gone, melting back into the forest as if it had never been there at all. I stood there for a long time, my rifle trained on the spot where I'd seen the creature, barely daring to breathe. But nothing else happened. Eventually the normal sounds of the forest returned. A hesitant chirp here, a rustle there, as if the woodland creatures were cautiously checking to see if the coast was clear. As the adrenaline faded, I tried to rationalize what I'd seen. Maybe it was just a bear, unusually large and moving strangely in the shadows. Maybe my eyes were playing tricks on me, fatigue and isolation finally taking their toll. But deep down, I knew better. Whatever I'd seen out there, it wasn't something that belonged in these woods. It wasn't something that should exist at all. That night, for the first time since I'd moved to the cabin, I locked my door. Sleep eluded me that night. I tossed and turned, my mind replaying the events of the evening, trying to make sense of what I'd seen and heard. Every creak of the cabin's old timber, every whisper of wind outside, had me sitting bolt upright, rifle in hand. As the first light of dawn began to filter through the windows, I made a decision. I needed to investigate to find some concrete evidence of what was out there, if only to prove to myself that I wasn't losing my mind. I geared up as if for a long hunting trip. Sturdy boots, layers of warm clothing, a pack with water and provisions. My trusty Remington, of course, and a hunting knife at my belt. As an afterthought, I grabbed my old digital camera. If I did find something out there, I wanted proof. The morning was crisp and clear, dew sparkling on every leaf and blade of grass. Under the bright light of day, last night's fears seemed almost silly, almost. I set out in the direction I'd seen the creature disappear, moving slowly and carefully. Years of hunting had taught me how to move quietly through the underbrush, how to spot signs of animal passage. But as I ventured deeper into the forest, I realized I wasn't seeing any of the usual signs of wildlife. No droppings, no tufts of fur caught on branches. Even the birds were unnaturally quiet. It was as if everything was hiding. After about an hour of careful progress, I stumbled upon something that made me pause. A clearing, one I'd never noticed before despite my many forays into these woods. It wasn't large, maybe the size of my cabin's main room, but it was perfectly circular, too perfect to be natural. In the center of the clearing stood the remains of a deer, or what was left of it. The animal had been torn apart, entrails spilling out onto the ground, its eyes wide open and clouded in death. But it wasn't the gruesome sight that held my attention. It was the tracks around it. They were massive, easily twice the size of my boot print. They had the general shape of a canine's paw, but elongated with claws that left deep gouges in the earth. I knelt down to get a closer look, running my hand over the edge of one of the prints, it was fresh, too fresh. I fumbled for my camera, snapping several pictures of the prints and the deer carcass. As I stood up, a twig snapped somewhere behind me. I spun around, rifle raised, but there was nothing there. Just trees, shadows, and the faint rustle of leaves in the breeze. But I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. My heart was pounding in my chest, sweat trickling down my back despite the cool air. I wasn't sure what I was dealing with, but I knew it was dangerous. Something beyond the natural order of things. I decided to head back to the cabin. Whatever was out here, I wasn't equipped to deal with it alone. I needed time to think, to plan. Maybe to reach out to someone who might have answers. 
As I made my way back, moving as quickly and quietly as I could, my mind raced. I'd never been one to believe in legends or folklore, but out here, alone, with something unknown stalking the woods, those old tales my grandfather used to tell didn't seem so far-fetched. He'd spoken of creatures that lived in the deep woods, beyond the reach of civilization. Ancient things that had been here long before humans set foot on this land. Things that most people had forgotten, but that still remembered us. I reached the cabin and bolted the door behind me, something I hadn't done since I first moved out here. The cabin was sturdy, built by hand with thick logs and a reinforced door. I told myself that whatever was out there wouldn't be able to get in, but deep down I wasn't so sure. As I downloaded the pictures from my camera to my rarely used laptop, I couldn't shake the feeling that I'd crossed a line, that by seeking out whatever was out there, I'd drawn its attention. And now it was hunting me. The hours dragged by as I sat in the growing darkness, the rifle across my lap, listening. The forest was quiet again, unnervingly so. I thought about turning on the generator for some light, but the thought of the noise it would make stopped me. I didn't want to draw attention, not to this place, not to myself. As the sun set painting the sky in brilliant oranges and reds before fading to an inky black, I found myself thinking about my life before the cabin, about Laura, about the life we'd planned together. We would talked about having kids, about moving to a quiet suburb where we could have a garden and a dog. It all seemed so distant now, like a half-remembered dream. I wondered what Laura would think of me now, living alone in the woods, jumping at shadows. Would she be proud of how I'd learned to survive on my own? Or would she be sad to see how isolated I'd become? My musings were interrupted by a sound that made my blood run cold. That same low, throaty rumble I'd heard the night before, but closer now, much closer. I stood up slowly, careful not to make a sound and moved to the window. The moonlight cast long shadows across the forest floor, and for a moment I thought maybe it had been my imagination playing tricks on me. But then I saw it. Standing just at the edge of the trees, partially obscured by shadows, was a creature unlike anything I'd ever seen before. It was huge, easily the size of a grizzly bear, but it moved with a fluidity that was almost feline. Its fur was dark, matted in places, and I could make out a long, narrow snout filled with sharp, jagged teeth. The closest thing I could compare it to was a hyena, but far more grotesque, more monstrous. Its eyes glowed with an unnatural intelligence, fixed on the cabin, fixed on me. And then it did something that made my heart nearly stop. It stood up on its hind legs. No animal should be able to do that. Not like this. It was almost humanoid in the way it moved, the way it stood, towering over the ground. And then it let out a sound that was halfway between a howl and a scream, a noise that echoed through the trees and set the night alive with movement. I could hear the distant calls of other animals responding, the forest suddenly alive with activity. But I barely registered it, my entire focus on the creature outside my cabin. I didn't wait to see what it would do next. I took aim and fired, the sound of the gunshot deafening in the enclosed space of the cabin. The creature recoiled, a dark liquid blood, I assumed, spraying from its shoulder. But it didn't fall. Instead, it dropped back onto all fours and bolted into the woods, disappearing into the darkness as quickly as it had appeared. I stayed up the rest of the night, rifle in hand, listening for any sign that it might return. But the forest remained quiet, the only sounds those of the wind rustling through the leaves and the distant call of an owl. When dawn finally broke, I stepped outside, my legs shaky from the tension of the night. The clearing was empty, the only sign of what had happened being the bloodstains on the ground where I had shot the creature. I followed the trail as far as I could, but it eventually disappeared into the underbrush, the ground too rocky to hold any more tracks. Whatever that thing was, it was gone. For now. As I made my way back to the cabin, my mind was reeling. I'd lived out here for years and I'd seen my share of strange things, but nothing like this. It wasn't a bear or a wolf or anything else that should be in these woods. It was something else, something old and dangerous. I knew I should probably leave, head into town, and report what I'd seen. But who would believe me? And more importantly, could I bring myself to abandon the life I'd built here, the peace I'd found in these woods? 
No, I decided. This was my home, and I wasn't about to let some creature, no matter how terrifying, chase me out. But I was going to be a lot more careful from now on, that's for sure. As for what it was, I could only guess. Maybe some kind of ancient predator that's managed to stay hidden all these years. Maybe something that's always been here, just waiting for the right moment to show itself. But whatever it was, it was out there, somewhere in those woods, and I had a feeling it would be back. Next time, though, I'll be ready. The days following my encounter with the creature were filled with a tense, watchful silence. I spent hours reinforcing the cabin's defenses, boarding up windows, setting up primitive alarms around the perimeter, anything I could think of to give myself an edge if, when, it returned. But as the days stretched into weeks with no sign of the beast, I found myself questioning my own memories. Had it really been as large as I remembered, as intelligent, or had fear and isolation warped my perceptions? I pored over the photos I'd taken in the clearing, studying every pixel for clues. The tracks were real enough, as was the savaged deer carcass, but neither provided concrete proof of what I'd seen that night. It was during this time that I realized how truly cut off I'd become from the rest of the world. I had no one to confide in, no one to seek advice from. The isolation that had once been my solace now felt suffocating. After much internal debate, I decided to make the trek into town. It was a grueling six-hour hike to the nearest settlement, a small logging community called Mill Ridge. I hadn't been there in over a year, and as I approached, I felt like a ghost returning to the land of the living. The town hadn't changed much, a handful of stores along the main street, a diner that had seen better days, and the ever-present hum of logging trucks in the distance. I made my way to the local library, a small single-story building that smelled of old books and dust. The librarian, an elderly woman named Mrs. Hodgson, looked up in surprise as I entered. Eli Stanton? Is that you? Good Lord, we thought you'd gone and disappeared on us. I managed a weak smile. Just been keeping to myself, Mrs. Hodgson. Listen, I was wondering if you had any books on local folklore. Legends, myths, that sort of thing. She raised an eyebrow, but didn't ask questions. Instead, she led me to a small section at the back of the library. Not much call for these, usually, she said, running a finger along the spines of several old, worn books. But we've got a few. Anything in particular you're looking for? I hesitated. How could I explain what I'd seen without sounding crazy? I'm interested in stories about creatures, in the woods, anything unusual or unexplained. Mrs. Hodgson's face changed, a flicker of something, fear, recognition, passing across it before she composed herself. Well, she said quietly, you might want to start with this one. She pulled out a thin, leather-bound volume titled Shadows in the Pines, Forgotten Legends of the North Woods. As I reached for the book, Mrs. Hodgson grabbed my wrist, her grip surprisingly strong for someone her age. Be careful, Eli, she said, her voice barely above a whisper. Some things are best left in the dark. Before I could respond, she had turned and shuffled back to her desk, leaving me alone with the book and a growing sense of unease. I spent the next few hours poring over the volume, my heart racing as I came across a section titled The Beast of Blackwood Forest. The description matched what I'd seen, a massive, wolf-like creature that walked on two legs, with intelligence in its eyes and an appetite for flesh. According to the book, sightings of the beast dated back centuries, with the earliest recorded encounter in 1673 by a French trapper. The stories were remarkably consistent over time, a creature that seemed to blur the line between animal and something else. What struck me most was a passage near the end of the section. The beast is said to be drawn to isolation and despair. It preys not just on the flesh, but on the very soul of those who have cut themselves off from the world of men. I closed the book, my hand shaking. It was as if the author had reached across time to speak directly to me, to my situation. As I left the library, the sun was setting, painting the sky in shades of red and gold. I knew I should start the long trek back to my cabin, but something made me hesitate. The thought of returning to that isolation, of facing whatever was out there alone, filled me with a dread I couldn't shake. I found myself at the town's only motel, a rundown place called the Pine View Inn. 
The clerk looked surprised to see a customer but handed over a key without much conversation. That night, as I lay in the unfamiliar bed, listening to the occasional passing car and the hum of the ancient air conditioner, I made a decision. I couldn't go back to the cabin. Not yet. Maybe not ever. I spent the next week in Millridge, slowly reacclimating to the presence of other people. I took odd jobs here and there, helping out at the hardware store, doing some basic computer work for the town office. It felt strange, using skills I'd almost forgotten I had. But as the days passed, I found myself growing restless. The town, which had seemed so alive when I first arrived, now felt stifling. I missed the quiet of the forest, the self-reliance of my life there. And more than that, I felt a growing sense of unfinished business. Whatever that creature was, it was still out there. And if the legends were true, it would keep hunting, keep killing. On the eighth day, I packed up my meager belongings and headed back into the woods. The hike seemed shorter this time, my steps purposeful and determined. As I approached my cabin, I half expected to find it destroyed, torn apart by the beast in my absence. But it stood just as I'd left it, a testament to the solidity of its construction and the peace of the forest around it. I spent the next few days preparing. I reinforced the doors and windows, set up more alarms around the perimeter. I cleaned my rifle and stocked up on ammunition, and I waited. It was on the third night that I heard it again, that low, rumbling growl that set my teeth on edge. But this time I was ready. I stepped out onto the porch, rifle in hand, and called out into the darkness. I know you're out there. Show yourself. For a long moment there was silence. Then, from the shadows at the edge of the clearing, it emerged. It was just as I remembered, massive, with matted dark fur and eyes that glowed with an unnatural intelligence. But this time I didn't feel fear. I felt recognition, as if I was facing a part of myself I'd long denied. The creature stood on its hind legs, towering over me. But it didn't attack. Instead, it tilted its head, as if considering me. In that moment, I understood. The beast wasn't just a predator. It was loneliness given form. Isolation made flesh. It was everything I'd embraced when I'd cut myself off from the world, taken to its terrible, logical conclusion. I lowered my rifle. I'm not alone anymore, I said, my voice steady, and neither are you. The creature let out a sound, not a growl this time, but something almost like a sigh. Then, slowly, it turned and loped back into the forest, disappearing into the shadows. I stood there for a long time, watching the spot where it had vanished. I knew it might return some day. The darkness, the isolation, they're always there, waiting at the edges of our lives. But for now, at least, they were gone, and I knew what I had to do. The next morning, I began the long hike back to Mill Ridge. It was time to rejoin the world, to find a balance between the solitude I craved and the human connection I needed. As I walked, I thought about Laura, about the life we'd planned. I thought about the years I'd spent alone in these woods, and I thought about the future, uncertain, yes, but full of possibilities. The forest around me was alive with the sounds of birds, of small animals going about their lives. Somewhere in the distance I heard the faint rumble of a logging truck. I smiled. It was good to be back. It's been two years since that night in the woods. I still live in my cabin, but I make regular trips into town now. I've even started doing some freelance IT work, using a satellite internet connection to stay connected to the outside world. Sometimes, on quiet nights, I think I hear that low growl in the distance. But it doesn't fill me with fear anymore. Instead, it's a reminder of the darkness we all carry inside us and of the importance of facing it head on. I don't know if what I saw was real or some manifestation of my own lonely psyche, but in the end, I suppose it doesn't matter. What matters is that I found my way back to myself, to the world, and if you ever find yourself in the deep woods of northern Maine and you hear something moving in the shadows, well, maybe it's just the wind, or maybe it's something else, something ancient and lonely, waiting for someone to understand. Just remember, the real monsters aren't in the forest. They're the ones we create when we cut ourselves off from the world, when we forget what it means to be human. Stay connected, stay alive, and never stop moving forward.
It was late August of 1987 when I found myself driving through the back roads of northern Minnesota. The sun was sinking low on the horizon, painting the sky in hues of orange and purple that filtered through the dense canopy of pine and birch trees. I'd been working as a seasonal ranger for the Chippewa National Forest for nearly six years by then, and the winding dirt roads felt as familiar to me as the lines on my own palm. My name is Michael Birdwing, and I've spent most of my life in these woods. Growing up on the White Earth Reservation had taught me to appreciate solitude and the outdoors, so being out here suited me just fine. My friends always joked that I was more comfortable with trees than people, and I couldn't really argue with that. As I navigated the old Ford pickup through a particularly rough stretch of road, my mind wandered back to my childhood. I remembered my grandfather, a respected elder in our community, teaching me about the spirits of the forest. The woods are alive, Michael, he'd say, his weathered hands gesturing to the trees around us. They have stories to tell if you know how to listen. Back then, I thought he was just trying to scare me into respecting nature. Now, after years in the forest service, I wasn't so sure. The radio crackled to life, startling me out of my reverie. Ranger Birdwing, come in. Over. I recognized the voice of Diane, our dispatch operator. I picked up the handset. This is Birdwing. Go ahead, Diane. Just checking in on your status. You heading up to the old fire lookout near Itasca? Affirmative, I replied, squinting as the fading sunlight hit my eyes at just the wrong angle. Should be there in about an hour, maybe less if this road cooperates. Copy that. Remember, we've had those reports of missing campers in the area. Keep your eyes peeled for anything unusual. I felt a slight chill run down my spine at her words. The missing campers. Three in the past month, if I remembered correctly. It wasn't unheard of for hikers to get lost in these parts, but three in such a short time was unusual. Will do, Diane. I'll radio in when I reach the tower. Birdwing out. As I replaced the handset, I couldn't shake an uneasy feeling. The forest seemed different somehow, more watchful. I shook my head, trying to clear away the ridiculous notion. Forests don't watch, they just are. The sky had been clear when I started my journey, but as I drove deeper into the wilderness, thick clouds began to roll in, casting a gray shadow over the tree line. The narrow dirt road felt more like a game trail now, flanked by towering pines that seemed to lean in swallowing up what little remained of the evening light. I knew this road well, having patrolled this stretch countless times, but something about the air felt heavier than usual. It had rained recently, and the smell of damp earth was thick, mingling with the pine needles and the faint scent of decay that always accompanied the turning of the seasons. As I rounded a bend, a flash of movement caught my eye. I slammed on the brakes, the truck skidding slightly on the damp ground. For a moment I could have sworn I saw something— a dark shape, too big to be a deer, too fast to be a bear. But as quickly as it appeared, it was gone, leaving me staring at nothing but shadows and trees. My heart was pounding, and I realized I had been holding my breath. I let it out slowly, trying to calm my nerves. Get it together, Michael, I muttered to myself. You're jumping at shadows now? But as I put the truck back in gear and continued on, I couldn't shake the feeling that something out there in the darkening forest was watching me. Waiting and for the first time in years, I found myself wishing I wasn't quite so alone out here in the wilderness. I parked the truck about a mile from the tower, not wanting to risk getting stuck in the mud. The rain had picked up, a light drizzle that seemed to hang in the air more than fall. Slinging my pack over my shoulder, I started up the trail, my boots squelching in the sodden earth. I hadn't gone more than fifty yards when I noticed something strange. Scattered along the path were several deer carcasses. At first I thought they were victims of a poacher, but upon closer inspection, it didn't look right. The bodies hadn't been skinned or gutted, and their throats were torn out, but in a way I couldn't explain. It wasn't clean like a knife wound or even the result of a wolf attack. There was a gnawing sense of wrongness in the way the flesh was ripped open. The blood had dried into the dirt like it had happened hours ago, but the bodies were fresh no signs of decay or scavenger activity. My grandfather's words echoed in my mind. The forest has its own hunters, Michael, some older than the trees themselves. I shook off the thought. This was no time for ghost stories. 
My instincts told me to turn back, but curiosity and duty kept me moving forward. What was I going to tell my supervisor? That I left because of a few dead deer? I kept walking, though I unholstered my sidearm, an old .357 Magnum that I'd kept since my rookie days. Its weight was reassuring in my hand, even as a voice in the back of my mind whispered that it might not be enough. As I got closer to the tower, I noticed the usual sounds of the forest were gone. No birds, no wind in the trees, not even the distant hum of crickets. The silence felt suffocating, broken only by the soft patter of rain and the sound of my own breathing. Then I saw it, barely thirty yards ahead. Something was crouched near the base of the fire tower, and it was feeding. My first thought was that it was a bear, maybe a wolf, but as I stepped closer I realized it wasn't like anything I had ever seen. It was huge, easily over seven feet tall if it had stood upright, with hunched shoulders covered in matted fur. The way it moved was unsettling, like it wasn't built to move on all fours, but did so out of necessity. Its limbs were too long, the back legs too short, giving it a lopsided, almost unnatural gait. I could see its mouth working over something, probably the remains of one of the deer. Then it stopped. It raised its head, nostrils flaring, and turned toward me. I froze, heart pounding, hand gripping the gun tightly. The face. It wasn't right. It had the elongated snout of a wolf, but the jaw was too wide, and the teeth, they didn't fit together like they should. They jutted out at odd angles, jagged, more like the maw of a wild boar than any predator I knew. It let out a sound, a kind of huff that reminded me of a horse, but it was far more primal, a sound that made the hair on my arms stand on end. Without warning, it moved, fast. I barely had time to raise my weapon before it was on me, knocking me backward into the underbrush. I fired, but I wasn't sure if I hit it. All I knew was the weight of the thing, the smell of wet fur, and the feeling of sharp claws raking across my leg. I screamed, kicked and rolled, firing again, this time hearing a sickening thud as the bullet found its mark. It staggered, just enough for me to scramble back to my feet, adrenaline pumping through my veins. The thing swayed, blood oozing from its side, but it didn't go down. I kept my gun trained on it, not sure whether to shoot again or run. But before I could decide, it turned and bolted into the woods, disappearing into the thick underbrush with a speed that didn't seem possible for something its size. For a moment I stood there panting, bleeding, trying to wrap my head around what I had just seen. Then I realized something. It had dropped whatever it had been eating. I forced myself to walk over to the base of the tower, my leg throbbing with each step. Lying there, half hidden in the grass, was the body of a young man, no older than twenty. His throat had been ripped out the same way as the deer. He wasn't dressed like a hiker. In fact, his clothes looked more like they belonged to a college kid. Jeans, a faded hoodie, sneakers, the missing camper, no doubt. I radioed for backup, though I knew it would take them hours to reach me. This is Ranger Birdwing, I said, my voice shaking more than I'd like to admit. I'm at the old fire tower near Itasca. I've... I found one of the missing campers, and something else. Send everyone you've got. Copy that, Ranger Birdwing? Diane's voice crackled back, concern evident in her tone. Are you injured? What do you mean by something else? I looked down at my leg, the denim of my jeans torn and stained with blood. I'm hurt, but it's not bad. As for the other thing, you wouldn't believe me if I told you. Just send help, and tell them to come armed. I wasn't about to wait around for that thing to come back, so I made my way back to the truck as fast as my injured leg would allow. I kept my gun out, ears straining for any sound that might signal its return. The rain had picked up, washing away the blood on my leg and probably any tracks that thing had left. As I drove back down the muddy road, my mind raced. What was that creature? Some kind of mutant wolf? A bear with a deformity? Or something else entirely? Something that shouldn't exist in this world? I remembered the stories my grandfather used to tell. Tales of shapeshifters and forest spirits that could take on monstrous forms. As a kid, I dismissed them as just that, stories. Now I wasn't so sure. When the search team arrived, they found the body exactly where I said it would be. There was no sign of the creature, but I didn't care. The boy's body was there, along with the remains of the deer. 
and that was all the proof I needed that what I had encountered was real. The official report called it a wolf attack. They said it was rare but not unheard of in that area. They chalked up my description of the thing to shock and adrenaline, and I didn't argue. It was easier that way, but I knew what I had seen, and I wasn't the only one who believed. A few days after the incident, as I was recovering at home, I received a visit from an elder from the reservation. He listened to my story without interruption, his weathered face grave. When I finished, he nodded slowly. Our people have known of such creatures for generations, he said, the Wendigo, the Skinwalker. They have many names, but they are real, as real as you and me. You are lucky to have survived, Michael. He left me with a small leather pouch filled with herbs and what looked like animal teeth. For protection, he said, though I hope you never need it again. I've been back in those woods many times since that night. I had to be. It's my job. But I've never seen that creature again. Sometimes, though, when the wind is right and the shadows are deep, I catch a scent on the air, wet fur and decay. And I remember, if I had to guess, I'd say it was something none of us had ever seen before. Something older than the forest itself. Maybe it was just hungry. Maybe it was defending its territory. Either way, I'm not going back to find out. But I keep my eyes open and my gun close. Because I know now that the forests hide more than just trees and animals. There are older things out there, watching and waiting. And sometimes they hunt. The years following my encounter in the woods near Atasca were marked by a constant struggle between my desire to forget and my need to understand. I continued my work as a forest ranger, but something had changed. The woods that had once been my sanctuary now held shadows I couldn't ignore. For months after the incident, I threw myself into research. I pored over old tribal records, spoke with elders from various Native American communities, and even reached out to cryptozoologists and folklore experts. Most dismissed my story as the product of stress and an overactive imagination but a few listened, and what they shared with me only deepened the mystery. I learned of similar sightings across North America, stretching back centuries. Creatures that walked the line between animal and something else, always tied to disappearances and unexplained deaths. The Algonquin spoke of the Wendigo, a creature born of human greed and hunger. The Navajo had tales of skinwalkers, shamans who could take on animal form, and in the forests of the Pacific Northwest, Stories of Sasquatch took on a darker tone when compared to what I had seen, but concrete evidence remained elusive. The official investigation into the camper deaths concluded with a statement about increased wolf activity in the area. The carcasses I had found were attributed to a particularly aggressive pack. My own injuries were recorded as the result of a fall during the investigation. I knew better, but I also knew the danger of pushing too hard against the official narrative so I kept my head down and did my job, all the while keeping my eyes open for any sign that the creature might return. Five years after the incident, I had almost convinced myself it had been a one-time event. Then the disappearances started again. This time it wasn't campers. Three hunters went missing over the course of a month, all within a ten-mile radius of the old fire tower. I was part of the search team, and this time I was prepared. I carried not only my service weapon, but also the protective charm the elder had given me years before. As we combed the woods, I felt a familiar unease settle over me. The forest was too quiet, the shadows too deep. We found two of the hunters, or what was left of them. The scene was eerily similar to what I had encountered years before, bodies torn apart, with no signs of typical predator behavior. The third hunter was never found. As I stood there, staring at the grisly scene, I caught a glimpse of movement at the edge of the clearing. For a split second I saw it. The same elongated snout, the misshapen body, the eyes that seemed to glow with an inner light. Our gazes locked, and in that moment I knew two things with absolute certainty. First, this creature, whatever it was, was intelligent. It recognized me just as I recognized it. And second, this was its territory. We were the intruders here. As quickly as it appeared, it vanished into the underbrush. I reported the sighting, but no one else had seen it. Once again, I was left with more questions than answers. In the years that followed, I rose through the ranks of the Forest Service. I used my position to implement stricter safety protocols for campers and hikers, 
and to quietly keep tabs on any unusual animal activity in the area. There were no more mass disappearances, but every few years, a lone hiker would vanish without a trace. Now, as I approach retirement, I find myself reflecting on that night in 1987 and all that came after. I've spent a career balancing my duty to protect the public with my understanding that there are things in this world beyond our comprehension. I still venture into the woods, though not as often as I used to. And when I do, I carry with me not just my gear and my gun, but also the knowledge that the forest holds secrets older than humanity itself. Some nights, when the wind howls through the trees and the moon casts long shadows, I think I hear something moving out there, something that doesn't belong, and I wonder if it remembers me as clearly as I remember it. To those who come after me, who patrol these woods and look after those who visit them, I leave this warning. Respect the forest and all it contains. But never forget that not everything that walks on four legs is an animal, and not every shadow is cast by the trees. The woods are alive, just as my grandfather said. They have stories to tell. But some of those stories are better left untold, and some creatures are better left unwatched. For in the deepest parts of the forest, where the shadows are darkest and the silence is complete, something is always watching back. I hate driving at night. Most truckers I know love it because the roads are clearer and you can cover more ground without getting caught in traffic. But not me. I've had my share of weird, creepy experiences on the road, and something about the darkness just feels wrong. Maybe it's because you can't see what's ahead of you or what's hiding in the shadows until it's too late. My name's Clyde Merrill. I've been driving trucks for nearly 20 years hauling everything from produce to heavy machinery. It's a tough job, but it pays the bills and has given me a chance to see parts of the country I'd never have visited otherwise. I've got stories that would make your hair stand on end, but none quite like what happened to me on that godforsaken night in northern Maine. It was supposed to be an easy run, a straight shot through miles of pine trees and two-lane highways that see maybe a handful of cars each hour. I was hauling a load of timber to a small lumberyard in Caribou, but I'd started out later than planned, which meant I'd be driving through the night. The sun had set hours ago, and the world outside my windshield had turned into an impenetrable wall of darkness, broken only by the occasional reflective road sign, or the glowing eyes of some nocturnal creature watching from the tree line. As I drove, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. Maybe it was the way the shadows seemed to move at the edge of my headlights, or how the trees loomed over the road, their branches reaching out like gnarled fingers. I'd driven this route dozens of times before, but tonight it felt different, alien, hostile. I reached for the radio, hoping to find some company in the voices of late-night DJs or fellow truckers on the CB, but all I got was static. The silence pressed in on me, broken only by the rumble of my engine and the rhythmic thump of tires on asphalt. I checked my phone, no signal. Out here, in the depths of the main wilderness, I was utterly alone. The digital clock on my dashboard read 1.37 a.m. when I saw it. At first it was just a shape in the distance, a darker patch against the black ribbon of road. As I drew closer my headlights caught it and my blood ran cold. There, sprawled across the asphalt like a broken doll, was a body. I slammed on the brakes, the sudden deceleration throwing me forward against my seatbelt. The truck's air brakes hissed and groaned as we skidded to a stop, mere feet from the prone figure. For a moment I just sat there, my hands gripping the steering wheel so tight my knuckles turned white. This couldn't be happening, not here, not now. But it was. And I knew that whatever came next would change my life forever. With shaking hands I put the truck in park and switched on the hazard lights. The red glow pulsed through the cab, painting everything in an eerie, bloody light. I took a deep breath, trying to steady my nerves then grabbed my flashlight from the glove compartment and climbed down from the cab. The night air hit me like a slap to the face, cold and damp. The forest pressed in on both sides of the road, a solid wall of darkness that seemed to swallow up the light from my truck. I swept my flashlight beam across the pavement, and there it was, the body of a man lying face up in the middle of the road. 
As I approached, the details came into sharp, horrifying focus. He was a big guy, probably in his late thirties or early forties, dressed in jeans and a flannel shirt that was now more red than plaid. His face was a mess of cuts and bruises, one eye swollen shut, his nose bent at an unnatural angle. But it was his position that really got to me. He lay spread-eagled, one arm twisted behind his back, his legs splayed out like he'd been thrown there by something much larger and much, much stronger than a human. I'd seen my share of roadkill over the years, but this... This was something else entirely. My stomach churned and I had to swallow hard to keep from losing my dinner all over the asphalt. Hey, I called out, my voice sounding thin and scared in the vast silence. Can you hear me? Are you? But I already knew the answer. The man's chest was still, his open eye staring blankly at the star-strewn sky above. A trickle of blood had run from the corner of his mouth, already starting to congeal in the cool night air. He was gone, and from the looks of it he hadn't gone easy. I fumbled for my phone, cursing under my breath as I remembered there was no signal out here. I was on my own, stuck on a deserted road in the middle of nowhere with a dead body and whatever the hell had done this to him. That's when I noticed the drag marks. They were faint, barely visible in the harsh glare of my flashlight, but unmistakable once I saw them. Two parallel lines in the dirt and gravel at the edge of the road, leading from the tree line to where the body lay. Something had pulled him out of the woods and left him here, right in the path of oncoming traffic. Why? Was it a twisted attempt at hiding the body, using passing vehicles to obliterate any evidence? Or was it something else, something I couldn't even begin to comprehend? I followed the trail with my eyes, trying to peer into the darkness beyond the road's edge. The woods seemed to shift and writhe, shadows moving in ways that shadows shouldn't. And deep within that inky blackness, I could have sworn I saw something move, something big. A twig snapped somewhere in the underbrush, and I nearly jumped out of my skin. My heart was pounding so hard I could feel it in my throat, and every instinct I had was screaming at me to get the hell out of there. But I couldn't. I couldn't just leave this poor bastard lying in the road. Couldn't pretend I hadn't seen what I'd seen. I had to do something. Had to get help. But how? As I stood there, paralyzed by indecision, a sound drifted out of the woods. It was faint at first, almost lost beneath the whisper of wind through the pines. But it grew louder, clearer, until there was no mistaking what it was. Laughter, deep, guttural, and utterly inhuman. And it was getting closer. I don't remember running back to the truck. One moment I was standing there, staring into the woods like a deer caught in headlights, and the next I was scrambling up into the cab, slamming the door behind me and fumbling with the keys. The laughter was louder now, echoing off the trees and seeming to come from everywhere at once. I cranked the engine, the familiar rumble doing little to calm my frayed nerves. My hands were shaking so bad I could barely grip the steering wheel but I managed to throw the truck into gear and hit the gas. The tires spun for a heart-stopping moment before finding purchase on the asphalt. I didn't even think about the body. All I knew was that I had to get away, had to put as much distance between myself and whatever was out there in the dark. As the truck lurched forward, I caught a glimpse of movement in my side mirror. Something huge and dark emerged from the tree line, moving with a speed that shouldn't have been possible for its size. I couldn't make out any details, just an impression of mass and hunger and ancient primal malevolence. I floored it, the engine roaring as I pushed it to its limits. The speedometer crept past seventy, eighty, ninety miles per hour, far too fast for these winding back roads, but I didn't care. Terror had its foot on the gas pedal, and I was just along for the ride. Minutes stretched into what felt like hours as I hurtled through the night taking turns too fast and praying I wouldn't meet any oncoming traffic. My eyes darted between the road ahead and the mirrors, half expecting to see that thing right behind me, reaching out with long, dark fingers to pluck me from the cab. But there was nothing. Just the empty road stretching out behind me, swallowed up by the darkness. Eventually the adrenaline began to fade, replaced by a bone-deep exhaustion and a gnawing sense of guilt. I'd left that poor bastard back there, alone on the road, what kind of person does that? What kind of coward? But even as I thought it, I knew I'd had no choice. Whatever had killed that man, whatever had dragged him out of the woods like a broken toy, it wasn't something I could have fought. 
Hell, it wasn't something I could even comprehend. As the first hints of dawn began to lighten the eastern sky, I finally allowed myself to slow down. My hands were cramped from gripping the wheel, and my shirt was soaked through with sweat. I needed to stop, needed to think, needed to figure out what the hell I was going to do next. Up ahead I saw the faint glow of lights, some kind of building, maybe a gas station or a diner. Civilization, or at least the closest thing to it out here in the backwoods. I eased off the gas, guiding the truck onto the gravel lot of what turned out to be a small truck stop. The place looked like it had seen better days. The neon sign above the door flickered weakly, half its letters burnt out, and the windows were grimy with years of road dust. But it was open, and right now that was all that mattered. I parked the truck and just sat there for a moment trying to gather my thoughts. The events of the night felt like a bad dream, something that couldn't possibly have happened in the real world. But the ache in my muscles and the lingering taste of fear in my mouth told me otherwise. I needed to call the police, needed to report what I'd seen. But would they believe me? Hell, I barely believed it myself, and I'd been there. How could I explain the body, the drag marks, the thing I'd glimpsed in the woods? With a heavy sigh, I reached for the door handle. There was only one way forward, and it started with a strong cup of coffee and whatever passed for breakfast in this godforsaken place. Maybe with some food in my stomach and some distance from the night's horrors, I could start to make sense of it all. But as I climbed down from the cab, I couldn't shake the feeling that this was far from over. Whatever I'd encountered out there in the dark, whatever had left that body for me to find, it wasn't done with me yet. And somewhere deep in the main wilderness, something ancient and hungry was stirring, awakened by the scent of fear and the promise of fresh prey. The bell above the door jangled discordantly as I pushed my way into the diner the sound making me jump despite my best efforts to stay calm. The place was nearly empty, just a couple of grizzled-looking guys nursing coffee at the counter and a waitress who looked like she'd rather be anywhere else. I slid into a booth near the back, my eyes darting to the windows every few seconds. The sky outside was starting to lighten, the inky blackness giving way to a dull, gunmetal gray, but the shadows still seemed too deep, too alive. Coffee? I nearly leapt out of my skin at the voice. The waitress was standing there, coffee pot in hand, looking at me like I was some kind of lunatic, which, to be fair, I probably resembled at that moment. Yeah, I managed, my voice sounding raspy and strange to my own ears. Yeah, coffee would be great, and, uh, whatever you've got for breakfast. She nodded and poured me a cup, the rich aroma doing little to settle my nerves. As she walked away, I pulled out my phone, praying for a signal. One bar. Not great, but it would have to do. My fingers shook as I dialed 911, the numbers blurring before my eyes. What was I going to say? How could I possibly explain what I'd seen? 911, what's your emergency? The dispatcher's voice was calm, professional, normal. It felt like it belonged to another world, one where things made sense and the darkness didn't hide unspeakable horrors. I... I need to report a body, I said, my voice barely above a whisper. On Route 11, about twenty miles north of Sherman, there's a man. He's... he's dead. Looks like he was attacked by something. There was a pause on the other end of the line, long enough that I thought the call might have dropped. Then, sir, are you sure about what you saw? Have you been drinking tonight? The question stung, but I couldn't really blame her. If someone had called me with a story like this, I'd probably think they were drunk or high, too. No, I haven't been drinking. I'm a truck driver. I was making a delivery to Caribou when I found him. Look, I know how this sounds, but I swear to God it's the truth. There's a dead man out there, and whatever killed him, it wasn't human. Another pause, shorter this time. All right, sir. I'm dispatching units to your location now. Can you stay on the line with me? I agreed, relief washing over me. They believed me or at least they were taking me seriously enough to send someone to check it out. As I waited, I filled the dispatcher in on the details, the body's position, the drag marks, the sound I'd heard in the woods. I left out the part about the thing I'd seen chasing me. That was a bridge too far, even for me. The waitress returned with my food, a plate piled high with eggs, bacon, and hash browns that looked like they'd been sitting under a heat lamp for hours. I wasn't hungry, 
but I forced myself to eat anyway. I needed to keep my strength up, needed to be ready for whatever came next. As I picked at my food, I couldn't help but overhear the conversation at the counter. The two men were talking in low voices, but in the near-empty diner their words carried. Third one this month, one of them was saying, his voice gruff and weary. Fish and wildlife says it's probably a bear, but I ain't never seen no bear do something like that. Ay, yeah, his companion agreed. Whatever it is, it ain't natural. My cousin Bert, he saw something out in the woods last week. Says it was big as a house, moved faster than anything he'd ever seen. Damn near soiled himself, he was so scared. I felt my blood run cold. They were talking about it, about the thing I'd seen, or something like it. This wasn't just a one-off event, it was part of a pattern. Something was out there in the main woods, something that had been preying on people for who knows how long. The bell over the door jangled again, and I looked up to see two state troopers walk in. They scanned the diner, their eyes landing on me. I knew what I must look like, disheveled, wild-eyed, reeking of fear and road sweat. But I also knew what I'd seen, what I'd experienced. And I was damned if I was going to let anyone brush it off as the ramblings of some sleep-deprived trucker. As the troopers approached my booth, I steeled myself for what was to come. I had a story to tell, one that would strain the bounds of belief. But it was the truth, and I owed it to that poor bastard I'd left on the road to make sure someone listened. Little did I know this was just the beginning. The horrors I'd witnessed that night were only a small taste of what was to come. A glimpse into a world of ancient terrors and primal fears that had been lurking in the shadows all along, waiting for someone to notice. And now that I had noticed, there was no going back. The long, dark road ahead was full of dangers I couldn't even imagine, and I was about to take my first steps down it, whether I was ready or not. The troopers slid into the booth across from me their faces a mask of professional detachment. The older of the two, a weathered man with salt-and-pepper hair and eyes that had seen too much, introduced himself as Sergeant Rourke. His partner, a younger guy who looked like he was fresh out of the academy, was Officer Dawson. Mr. Merrill, Sergeant Rourke began, his voice gruff but not unkind. We understand you've had quite a night. Why don't you walk us through what happened from the beginning? I took a deep breath, trying to organize my thoughts. How could I possibly convey the terror of what I'd experienced? But I had to try. I owed it to the dead man, to myself, and to anyone else who might fall victim to whatever was out there. So I told them everything. The body on the road, the drag marks leading from the woods, the inhuman laughter, and the massive shape I'd glimpsed in my rearview mirror. As I spoke, I could see the skepticism growing in their eyes, particularly in Officer Dawson's but I pressed on, determined to make them understand. When I finished, there was a long moment of silence. Sergeant Rourke's face was unreadable, but Dawson couldn't hide his disbelief. He exchanged a glance with his partner before speaking. Mr. Merrill, he said, his tone cautious, that's quite a story. But we've had units searching that stretch of road for the past hour, and they haven't found any sign of a body or any disturbance. I felt like I'd been punched in the gut. That's impossible, I protested. I know what I saw. It was right there in the middle of the road. You can't miss it. Rourke held up a hand, silencing me. We're not saying we don't believe you saw something, sir. But the fact is, there's no evidence to support your claim. No body, no blood, no drag marks, nothing. That's because whatever killed him came back for the body, I insisted, my voice rising. I could feel the eyes of the other diner patrons on me, but I didn't care. I'm telling you, there's something out there, something dangerous. Dawson leaned forward, his voice low and intense. Mr. Merrill, have you been taking any medications, any history of hallucinations or mental health issues? I slammed my fist on the table, making the coffee cups rattle. Damn it, I'm not crazy. I know what I saw. Rourke put a calming hand on his partner's arm. Easy, Dawson, he murmured before turning back to me. Mr. Merrill, we're not accusing you of anything. But you have to understand how this looks from our perspective. We have no evidence, and your story is, well, it's hard to believe. I slumped back in my seat, the fight going out of me. Of course they didn't believe me. How could they? If I hadn't lived it myself, I wouldn't believe it either. Look, Rourke continued, his tone softer now. Why don't you get some rest? There's a motel just down the road. 
We'll keep investigating, and if we find anything, we'll let you know. I nodded numbly, suddenly feeling every one of my years and every mile I'd driven that night. As the troopers stood to leave, Rourke paused, looking down at me with an expression I couldn't quite read. Off the record, he said quietly, I've been patrolling these woods for twenty years, and I've seen things, things I can't explain. I'm not saying I believe your story, but I'm not dismissing it either. Just be careful out there, Mr. Merrill. These woods have secrets, and some of them are better left undisturbed. With that cryptic warning, they left, the bell jangling behind them. I sat there for a long time, staring into my cold coffee, trying to make sense of everything that had happened. Finally, exhaustion won out. I paid my bill and trudged out to my truck, the weight of the night's events heavy on my shoulders. The motel Rourke had mentioned was just visible down the road, its vacant sign flickering weakly in the gray morning light. As I climbed into the cab to drive the short distance, a chill ran down my spine. In the side mirror, just for a moment, I thought I saw a dark shape at the edge of the woods behind the diner. But when I blinked, it was gone. Maybe I was going crazy after all. Or maybe, just maybe, the real madness was in denying what was right in front of me. Either way, I knew one thing for certain. My simple delivery run had turned into something far more dangerous, and it was far from over. The motel room was exactly what you'd expect from a backwoods establishment, musty, outdated, and vaguely depressing. But it had a bed and a shower, and right then, that was all I cared about. I stood under the hot water for what felt like hours, trying to wash away the night's horrors along with the road grime. But no matter how hard I scrubbed, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched, of something lurking just out of sight. When I finally emerged, the bathroom mirror was fogged over. As I wiped it clear, I barely recognized the face staring back at me. My eyes were bloodshot, dark circles etched beneath them, and there was a haunted look I had never seen before. I collapsed onto the bed, every muscle aching. Despite my exhaustion, sleep didn't come easily. Every time I closed my eyes, I saw that body on the road, heard that inhuman laughter echoing through the trees. When I finally did drift off, my dreams were a confused jumble of dark forests, glowing eyes, and the sound of something massive moving through the underbrush, always just out of sight. I woke with a start, disoriented in the unfamiliar room. The digital clock on the nightstand read 3.47 p.m. I'd slept most of the day away, but I didn't feel rested. If anything, I felt worse. As I sat up, rubbing the sleep from my eyes, I became aware of a sound. At first I thought it was just the hum of the ancient air conditioner, but as I listened I realized it was something else. Voices, low and indistinct, coming from outside. I moved to the window, pulling back the curtain just enough to peer out. The parking lot was mostly empty, just my truck and a couple of beat-up cars. But at the edge of the lot, near the tree line, I saw them. Three men stood in a tight circle, talking in hushed tones. I recognized two of them as the guys from the diner counter. The third was a stranger, tall and lean, dressed in what looked like a park ranger's uniform. I couldn't make out what they were saying, but their body language spoke volumes. They were afraid, casting nervous glances at the woods every few seconds. The ranger seemed to be trying to calm them down, but I could see the tension in his own posture. Suddenly the ranger's head snapped up, his eyes locking onto my window. I let the curtain fall back into place, my heart pounding. Had he seen me? And if he had, why did it feel like I'd just been caught spying on something I wasn't supposed to see? I backed away from the window, my mind racing. What were they talking about out there? Did it have something to do with what I'd seen last night? Before I could ponder it further, my phone buzzed. I had a message from my dispatcher. Clyde, where the hell are you? The lumberyard in Caribou is raising hell about their delivery. Call me ASAP. Reality came crashing back. I still had a job to do, a delivery to make. But how could I just climb back in my truck and act like nothing had happened? How could I drive those dark, lonely roads knowing what was out there? But I didn't have a choice. I was already late and I couldn't afford to lose this job. Whatever was going on in these woods, whatever dark secret these people were hiding, I had to push it aside and focus on the task at hand. As I gathered my things and prepared to check out, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was making a terrible mistake. 
Every instinct I had was screaming at me to get as far away from this place as possible. But I've been a trucker for 20 years, and if there's one thing I've learned, it's that the road doesn't care about your fears or your doubts. It just stretches out before you, demanding to be traveled. So I squared my shoulders, took a deep breath, and stepped out into the fading afternoon light. Whatever lay ahead, whatever horrors awaited me on that long, dark road, I would face them. Because that's what truckers do. We keep moving no matter what. As I climbed into my rig and fired up the engine, I caught movement out of the corner of my eye. The ranger was standing at the edge of the parking lot watching me, and for just a moment I could have sworn his eyes flashed with an inhuman predatory gleam. Then I blinked, and he was just a man again, raising a hand in a casual wave as I pulled out onto the road. The forests of northern Maine stretched out before me, dark and forbidding. As I drove deeper into their shadows, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being drawn into something ancient and terrible, a mystery as old as the woods themselves. And somewhere out there, in the gathering darkness, something was waiting for me. The road to Caribou stretched out before me, a ribbon of asphalt cutting through the endless green of the main forests. Under normal circumstances, I would have enjoyed the drive. The scenery up here is something else, all towering pines and rugged hillsides. But today every shadow seemed to hide a threat, every rustle in the underbrush a potential monster. I kept the radio on, flipping between stations in a desperate attempt to drown out my own thoughts. But the reception was spotty at best, and in the stretches of silence between bursts of static-filled music, I found my mind wandering back to the horrors of the previous night. The sun was sinking low on the horizon, painting the sky in shades of orange and purple. It was beautiful in a way but all I could think about was how quickly the light was fading. Soon darkness would fall, and I'd be alone out here again. As I rounded a bend, something caught my eye. There, just off the shoulder of the road, was a car. It was an old model, maybe from the 90s, and it was just sitting there. No hazard lights, no sign of the driver, just an abandoned vehicle in the middle of nowhere. Every instinct I had told me to keep driving. I was already late for my delivery. And after what I'd been through, the last thing I needed was to get involved in someone else's problem. But I couldn't just leave someone stranded out here, not with what I knew was lurking in these woods. Cursing under my breath, I eased the truck onto the shoulder and brought it to a stop. I sat there for a moment, engine idling, trying to work up the courage to get out. Finally, with a deep breath, I grabbed my flashlight and climbed down from the cab. The moment my boots hit the gravel, I was on high alert. The woods seemed to press in around me, the trees looming overhead like silent sentinels. I approached the car cautiously, my flashlight beam cutting through the gathering gloom. Hello? I called out. Anyone here? You need some help? No response. As I got closer, I could see that the car's windows were fogged up from the inside. Strange, given the warm evening air. I reached out to tap on the driver's side window, but as soon as my knuckles made contact with the glass, I knew something was wrong. The window was ice cold. I stumbled back, my heart racing. This wasn't right. None of this was right. I swept my flashlight beam across the car's interior, and what I saw made my blood run cold. The inside of the car was covered in frost. Thick rime coated the windows, the dashboard, even the steering wheel. It looked like the inside of a freezer, not a car that had been sitting in the summer heat. And there, in the driver's seat, was a figure. It was slumped over the wheel, motionless, its features obscured by the frost on the window. But even through the ice I could see that its skin had a blue tinge that had nothing to do with the cold. I backed away, fumbling for my phone. I needed to call the police, needed to report this. But as I raised the phone to my ear I heard it, that same low, guttural laughter I'd heard in the woods the night before. It was coming from the trees behind me, and it was getting closer. I don't remember running back to the truck. One moment I was standing there, paralyzed with fear, and the next I was scrambling up into the cab, slamming the door behind me and fumbling with the keys. As I fired up the engine and threw the truck into gear, I caught a glimpse of movement in my side mirror. Something huge and dark was emerging from the tree line, moving with a speed that shouldn't have been possible for its size. I floored it, the engine roaring as I pulled back onto the road. 
In my rearview mirror I saw the thing pause by the abandoned car. Even from a distance I could see that it was massive, easily seven or eight feet tall, with long gangly limbs and a shape that seemed to shift and change as I watched. For a moment it stood there, its head tilted as if listening. Then, slowly, it turned towards my retreating truck. I couldn't see its face, if it even had one, but I felt its gaze lock onto me with an almost physical force. Then it smiled. Dear God, it smiled, a wide, terrible grin full of teeth that gleamed like icicles in the fading light. I drove faster than I ever had in my life, pushing the old truck to its limits. The road ahead blurred, trees whipping past in a green smear. I don't know how long I drove like that, my hands clenched on the wheel, my eyes darting between the road ahead and the mirrors, half expecting to see that thing right behind me. But there was nothing. Just the empty road stretching out behind me, swallowed up by the encroaching night. As the adrenaline began to fade, I found myself shaking uncontrollably. What the hell had I just seen? What was that thing? And what had it done to the person in that car? I wanted to believe it was just my imagination, just stress and lack of sleep playing tricks on me. But I knew better. I'd seen it with my own eyes, felt the unnatural cold emanating from that car. Whatever was happening in these woods, it was real, and it was far more terrifying than anything I could have imagined. As I finally saw the lights of Caribou in the distance, I made a decision. As soon as I dropped off this load, I was done. No more long-haul routes, no more nights alone on the road. I'd find a new job, maybe something local. Anything to keep me away from these dark, lonely highways and the horrors that lurked beyond the reach of my headlights. But even as I thought it, a small voice in the back of my mind whispered a terrible truth. It was too late. I'd seen something I wasn't supposed to see, stumbled into a world of ancient terrors and primal fears. And now that I knew it existed, there was no going back. The long, dark road ahead was full of dangers I couldn't even imagine, and I was already on it, whether I was ready or not. As I pulled into the lumberyard, the first stars were coming out overhead. But as I looked up at them, all I could think about was how very, very far away their light seemed, and how deep and endless the darkness between them truly was. The lumberyard was a hive of activity when I arrived, despite the late hour. Floodlights bathed the area in harsh white light, creating deep, unsettling shadows at the edges of the yard. Workers moved back and forth, loading and unloading trucks. The air filled with the sound of machinery and shouted instructions. As I backed my rig into the unloading area, a burly man in a hard hat approached. His name tag identified him as Mike, the yard supervisor. His face was set in a scowl as he checked his clipboard. You Merrill? he asked gruffly. When I nodded, his frown deepened. You're late. We've been waiting on this shipment all day. I opened my mouth to explain, to tell him about the body on the road, the thing in the woods, the frozen car. But the words died in my throat. How could I possibly make him understand? Sorry, I managed instead. Ran into some trouble on the road. Mike grunted, clearly unimpressed with my vague explanation. Well, you're here now. Let's get this unloaded so we can all go home. As the workers began unloading the timber, I stood off to the side, feeling useless and on edge. Every sound made me jump. Every shadow seemed to move. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched that something out there in the darkness was waiting, biding its time. First time up this way? I turned to find an older man standing next to me. He was thin and weathered with deep-set eyes that had seen too much. His name tag read Earl. No, I replied, but it's been a while. Things seem different somehow. Earl nodded sagely. Ah, oh, yeah, things are always changing up here. But some things, some things stay the same. He glanced around as if making sure no one was listening, then leaned in close. You saw something out there, didn't you? Something you can't explain. I felt a chill run down my spine. How did you? I've been working these woods for nigh on fifty years, Earl interrupted. I've seen things, heard things, things that don't make no sense in the light of day. He paused, his eyes boring into mine. But they're real, sure as you and me, and they're getting bolder. I swallowed hard, my mouth suddenly dry. What are they? Earl shook his head. Nobody knows for sure. 
Some say they're spirits of the old forests, angry at us for cutting down their trees. Others think they're something older, something that was here long before us and will be here long after we're gone. He sighed heavily. All I know is they're dangerous and they're hungry. Before I could ask any more questions, Mike called out that the unloading was finished. Earl gave me a significant look before shuffling away, leaving me with more questions than answers. As I climbed back into my truck, I couldn't shake Earl's words. They echoed in my mind, mixing with the memories of what I'd seen on the road. I started the engine, the familiar rumble doing little to calm my nerves. Just as I was about to pull out, there was a tap on my window. I nearly jumped out of my skin. It was Earl again, his face grave in the harsh yard lights. Listen, he said, his voice low and urgent. Whatever you do, don't stop on the road back. Don't pull over for nothing, you hear? And if you see any lights in the woods, any lights at all, you keep driving, no matter what. With that cryptic warning, he stepped back, melting into the shadows of the lumber yard. I sat there for a moment, my hands shaking on the wheel. Part of me wanted to stay, to demand more answers from Earl. But a larger part, the part that had seen that thing in the woods, knew I had to get moving. As I pulled out onto the main road, the lumberyard's lights fading behind me, I felt a sense of dread settling over me like a shroud. The road ahead was dark, winding through forests that suddenly seemed much older and much more malevolent than I'd ever realized. I tried to focus on the road, on the pool of light cast by my headlights, but my mind kept drifting. What had Earl meant about lights in the woods? And what was out there, watching and waiting in the darkness? About an hour into my journey, I saw it. At first I thought it was just my imagination, a trick of the light. But as I rounded a bend I saw it clearly, a soft blue-white glow emanating from deep in the woods to my right. It was beautiful in a way, ethereal, almost hypnotic. Without realizing it I found my foot easing off the gas pedal, the truck slowing as I stared at the light. Earl's warning echoed in my mind. If you see any lights in the woods, any lights at all, you keep driving, no matter what. But surely he couldn't have meant this light. This was different. This was calling to me. I felt an overwhelming urge to pull over, to step out of the truck and walk into the woods, to find the source of that beautiful, mesmerizing glow. My hand was on the door handle when a horn blared, shocking me back to reality. A car sped past in the opposite lane, the driver gesturing angrily. I drifted across the center line without even realizing it. Heart pounding, I wrenched the wheel, bringing the truck back into my lane. The light in the woods was gone as if it had never been there at all. Cold sweat beaded on my forehead as the full impact of what had almost happened hit me. If that car hadn't come along when it did, I shuddered, pressing down hard on the accelerator. Whatever that light was, whatever was out there in those woods, it had nearly lured me to my death and I had a sickening feeling that I knew what had happened to the driver of that frozen car I'd found earlier. The rest of the drive passed in a blur of paranoia and adrenaline. Every shadow seemed to move, every bend in the road promised new horrors. By the time I finally saw the lights of the next town, I was a nervous wreck. I pulled into the first motel I saw, a rundown place that had seen better days. But it was well lit, and right now, that was all I cared about. As I lay in bed that night, staring at the water-stained ceiling, I knew sleep wouldn't come easily. The events of the past two days swirled in my mind, a maelstrom of horror and confusion. What were those things in the woods? What did they want? And how long had they been there preying on unsuspecting travelers? I didn't have answers to any of these questions, but I knew one thing for certain. My days as a long-haul trucker were over. I couldn't face those dark, lonely roads again not knowing what I knew now. But even as I made this decision, a small voice in the back of my mind whispered a terrible truth. It might already be too late. I'd seen something I wasn't supposed to see, stumbled into a world of ancient terrors and primal fears, and now that I knew it existed, there was no going back. As I finally drifted off into an uneasy sleep, my dreams were filled with shifting shadows, inhuman laughter, and a hypnotic blue-white light that called to me from the depths of an endless, hungry darkness. I woke with a start, my heart pounding, sheets soaked with sweat. For a moment I didn't know where I was. Then reality came crashing back, 
the motel, the horrors of the past two days, the decision I'd made to quit long-haul trucking. Sunlight streamed through the gaps in the cheap curtains, painting stripes across the worn carpet. In the light of day, my experiences seemed almost like a bad dream. Almost, but not quite. The fear was still there, a cold knot in the pit of my stomach. I showered and dressed mechanically, my mind racing. What was I going to do now? I had a life built around trucking. It was all I'd known for the past twenty years. But I knew I couldn't go back out there, couldn't face those dark roads and whatever lurked beyond them. As I was checking out, my phone buzzed. It was a text from my dispatcher. Clyde, got another run for you. Banger to Presque Isle. Call me ASAP. I stared at the message, my finger hovering over the call button. It would be so easy to fall back into routine, to convince myself that what I'd seen was just stress and exhaustion playing tricks on my mind. But I knew better. I'd seen the truth hiding in the shadows of these forests, and I couldn't unsee it. With a deep breath, I called the dispatcher. Hey, Bill, I said when he picked up. Listen, I need to talk to you about something. I explained that I was quitting, effective immediately. I gave him some vague excuse about health issues, not daring to tell him the real reason. He wasn't happy, but he understood. Twenty years of reliable service bought me some goodwill, at least. As I ended the call, I felt a weight lift from my shoulders. But it was quickly replaced by a new anxiety. What was I going to do now? I was mulling over this question as I walked to my truck, keys in hand. But as I approached, I stopped short. There, tucked under my windshield wiper, was a piece of paper. My hand shook as I reached for it. It was a note, written in a shaky elderly hand. Meet me at Rosie's Diner. Noon. Come alone. Earl. I checked my watch. It was just past eleven. Rosie's Diner was just down the street. I'd passed it on my way in last night. Part of me wanted to ignore the note, to climb in my truck and drive as far away from this place as I could get. But a larger part knew that I couldn't. Not yet. Not until I had some answers. Rosie's Diner was a typical small-town greasy spoon, all chrome and red vinyl. As I pushed through the door, the bell jangling overhead, I spotted Earl immediately. He was hunched over a cup of coffee in a booth at the back, his eyes darting nervously around the room. I slid into the seat across from him. Up close, he looked even older and more haggard than I remembered. His hands shook slightly as he raised his coffee cup to his lips. You came, he said, his voice a dry rasp. Good. We don't have much time. Time for what? I asked. What's going on, Earl? What are those things in the woods? He shushed me, glancing around furtively. Not so loud. They have ears everywhere. He leaned in close, his voice dropping to a whisper. What you saw out there, it's just the tip of the iceberg. There's a war going on. Has been for centuries. Most folks don't know about it, don't want to know. But some of us, some of us have to fight. I stared at him, trying to process what he was saying. A war? Between who? Between us and them, Earl replied, as if it was the most obvious thing in the world. The things in the woods, the old ones. They were here first, you see, and they want it back. He reached into his jacket and pulled out a small leather-bound book. He slid it across the table to me. Everything you need to know is in here. Names, dates, encounters. A history of the war they don't teach you in school. I picked up the book feeling its weight in my hands. It looked old, the leather cracked and worn. Why are you giving this to me? Earl's eyes met mine, and for a moment I saw a flash of the man he must have been in his youth, strong, determined, unafraid. Because you've seen them now. You're part of this whether you want to be or not, and we need all the help we can get. Before I could respond, Earl stiffened, his eyes fixed on something over my shoulder. They're here, he hissed. Take the book and go. Now. I turned to look, but Earl grabbed my arm. Don't look at them, he warned. Just go. And whatever you do, don't stop driving until you're out of Maine. They can't follow you past the state line. Not easily, anyway. I stood up, the book clutched to my chest. As I hurried towards the door, I couldn't resist a quick glance back. What I saw made my blood run cold. Two men had entered the diner. They looked ordinary enough, flannel shirts, work boots, the kind of outfit you'd see on any logger or mill worker. But their eyes? Their eyes were wrong. Too dark, too deep, like bottomless pits that could swallow you whole. 
They were looking right at me. I burst out of the diner and ran for my truck. As I fumbled with the keys, I heard the diner door open behind me. I didn't look back. I didn't dare. I peeled out of the parking lot, tires squealing. In my rearview mirror, I saw the two men standing in front of the diner watching me go. They weren't chasing, weren't even moving. They didn't need to. Their message was clear. We know who you are. We know what you've seen. And we'll be waiting. As I sped down the highway, putting as much distance between myself and Rosie's diner as I could, I realized that my life had changed irrevocably. I was part of something bigger now, something darker and more dangerous than I could have ever imagined. The book Earl had given me sat on the passenger seat, a silent promise of answers, and, I suspected, even more questions. I didn't know what I was going to do next, where I was going to go, but I knew I couldn't ignore this. Not anymore. The war Earl had spoken of was real, and somehow, without meaning to, I'd just enlisted. As I crossed the state line, leaving Maine behind, I felt a weight lift from my shoulders, but I knew it was temporary. Whatever was out there, whatever had made its home in the dark forests of Maine, it wouldn't stay there forever. Sooner or later it would spread, and when it did, someone would have to stand against it. As the sun set behind me, painting the sky in shades of red and gold, I made a silent vow. I would learn, I would prepare, and when the time came, I would fight. Because the long, dark road ahead was full of dangers I couldn't even imagine, but now at least I knew they were there, and knowledge, as they say, is power. The war had begun, and I was ready to play my part. I used to think there wasn't much in the world that could shake me. After all, my life had been a string of adrenaline-fueled missions, each more dangerous than the last. My name is Roland Vanbrook, and I've spent the last 15 years working for a shadowy unit, buried deep within the U.S. government, tasked with hunting the things that aren't supposed to exist. Cryptids, monsters, creatures that lurk in the forgotten corners of the world. You name it, I've probably seen it or something like it. But there's something about the ocean, the way it stretches out into infinity, swallowing light and hope alike, that's always put a knot in my stomach. So when the call came about a string of disappearances off the coast of Washington State, I was less than thrilled to be the one selected for the mission. It was a crisp autumn morning when my secure phone buzzed. I was in my modest apartment in Arlington, Virginia, nursing a cup of black coffee and trying to shake off the remnants of my latest nightmare. The nightmares were always there, a constant companion after years of seeing things no human was meant to see. Vanbrook, I answered, my voice still gravelly from sleep. Roland, it's Hammond, came the stern voice of my handler. We've got a situation brewing up in Washington State. Five divers have gone missing in the past month, all in the same area. Local authorities are stumped. I pinched the bridge of my nose, already feeling a headache coming on. Any signs of our kind of activity? There was a pause on the other end of the line. Nothing concrete, but the circumstances are unusual. All experienced divers, no distress calls, no bodies recovered. It's like they simply vanished into thin air. Or in this case, water. I sighed, knowing where this was going. You want me to check it out? You're the best we've got, Roland. If there's something out there that shouldn't be, you'll find it. Your partner for this mission will be Cliff Delaney. You two work well together. Cliff. At least that was some good news. We'd been through hell together more times than I could count. If there was one man I wanted by my side when things went south, it was him. Where exactly are we headed? I asked, already moving to pack my go bag. A small coastal town called Port Lock. The disappearances have all been centered around an area the locals call Dead Man's Cove. I couldn't help but chuckle darkly. Well, that's not ominous at all. Your flight leaves in three hours. Good luck, Roland. And be careful out there. The waters in that region, they say they're haunted by old spirits. I ended the call and stood there for a moment, staring out my window at the bustling streets of Arlington. Little did those people know about the horrors that lurked in the shadows of their world. As I packed my bag, I couldn't shake the feeling that this mission was going to be different. The ocean had always unsettled me, 
and now I was about to dive headfirst into its depths. Little did I know old spirits would be the least of our worries. The flight to Seattle was uneventful, a blessing in my line of work. Cliff and I met at the airport, exchanging our usual greetings, a firm handshake and a knowing look. We'd seen too much together to need many words. Ready to get wet, old man? Cliff grinned, his weathered face creasing with amusement. I snorted, hefting my bag over my shoulder. About as ready as I'll ever be. Let's just hope whatever's out there is more afraid of us than we are of it. We rented a nondescript SUV and began the long drive to Port Lock. As we left the bustling city behind, the landscape transformed. Towering evergreens lined the winding coastal road, their branches reaching out like gnarled fingers. The sky turned a foreboding gray, heavy with the promise of rain. So what's your take on this one? Cliff asked as he navigated a particularly sharp turn. I gazed out at the churning sea visible through breaks in the trees. Honestly, I'm not sure. Could be anything from a rogue shark to, well, you know. Cliff nodded grimly. We'd seen enough in our careers to know that the impossible was often just improbable. And in our line of work, improbable was an everyday occurrence. As we approached Port Lock, the atmosphere seemed to change. The air grew thick with salt and something else. Something foul that I couldn't quite place. It reminded me of rotting fish left out in the sun, but there was an underlying wrongness to it that set my teeth on edge. Port Lock itself was a study in decay. What must have once been a bustling fishing town now seemed half abandoned. Weathered buildings stood silent sentinel along the main street, their paint peeling and windows boarded up. The few people we saw hurried along with their heads down, casting furtive glances at our unfamiliar vehicle. We pulled up to the Port Lock Inn, a dilapidated two-story building that had seen better days. As we got out of the car, the wind whipped up, carrying with it that same foul odor I'd noticed earlier. Cliff wrinkled his nose. You smell that? he asked, his eyes scanning the empty street. I nodded, my hand instinctively moving to the concealed weapon at my hip. Yeah, something's not right here. The inn's lobby was deserted save for an elderly man behind the counter. He eyed us warily as we approached, his gnarled hands gripping the edge of the desk. We'd like a room for a few nights, I said, putting on my best tourist smile. The old man's roomy eyes narrowed. You hear about them divers? Cliff and I exchanged a quick glance. So much for blending in. We heard about the accidents, Cliff said carefully. Thought we'd come check out the diving spots for ourselves. The old man barked out a harsh laugh. Accidents? Ain't no accidents, mister. Them waters are cursed. Always have been. You boys best turn around and head back where you came from. I leaned in, dropping my voice. What do you mean, cursed? The old man looked around nervously, as if afraid someone might overhear. There's things out there in them waters. Things that ain't natural. Been that way since... Well, since the incident. What incident? Cliff pressed. But the old man clammed up, shaking his head vigorously. No, no, I've said too much already. You want a room or not? We took the key and headed up to our room, the floorboards creaking ominously under our feet. The room itself was sparse but clean, with two twin beds and a window that looked out over the angry sea. Cliff tossed his bag on one of the beds. Well, that was informative. I moved to the window, staring out at the turbulent waters. In the distance I could just make out a rocky outcropping that I assumed must be Dead Man's Cove. Even from here there was something forbidding about it. We need to talk to the locals, I said, turning back to Cliff. Find out more about this incident the old man mentioned, and we need to get out on that water. Cliff nodded, his expression grim. I've got a bad feeling about this one, Roland. Whatever's out there, it's big, and it's hungry. As if in response, a mournful wail echoed across the water, sending a chill down my spine. It wasn't the cry of any seabird I'd ever heard. It was something else entirely, something that didn't belong in this world. Sleep didn't come easily that night. The wind howled outside our window, carrying with it that same putrid smell that seemed to permeate the entire town. I tossed and turned, my mind racing with possibilities, each more terrifying than the last. In the early hours of the morning I was startled awake by a noise. At first I thought it was just the wind, but as I lay there straining my ears I realized it was something else. Voices. Whispering. 
I sat up, glancing over at Cliff. He was already awake, his hand on his weapon. Our eyes met in the darkness, and I knew he heard it too. Silently we crept to the window. The street below was empty, shrouded in a thick mist that seemed to glow faintly in the moonlight. But the whispers were clearer now, coming from somewhere to our left. We dressed quickly and made our way downstairs, moving as quietly as we could. The old man at the desk was nowhere to be seen. The lobby was dark and silent, save for the persistent whispers that seemed to be coming from just outside. Cliff reached for the door, but I grabbed his arm, shaking my head. Something wasn't right. The whispers were too uniform, too rhythmic. It was almost like chanting. We moved to a side window instead, peering out into the mist. At first I couldn't see anything. Then slowly shapes began to emerge from the fog. People, at least a dozen of them, moving in a procession down the street towards the harbor. They were dressed oddly, in what looked like old-fashioned oilskins and sou'westers, but it was their faces that made my blood run cold. In the pale moonlight, their skin had a sickly, greenish tinge. Their eyes were too large, too round, and seemed to glow with an inner light. And their mouths, they moved in perfect unison, whispering words in a language I'd never heard before. It sounded ancient guttural, more like the noises a dying animal might make than any human speech. As we watched, frozen in horror, the procession moved past our window. The stench that accompanied them was overwhelming. That same rotting fish smell, but stronger now, mixed with the unmistakable odor of decay. The last figure in the procession turned its head as it passed, its glowing eyes seeming to look right at us. I felt a wave of nausea and dizziness wash over me, in that moment I saw flashes of something, vast, dark shapes moving in the depths, a city of cyclopean stone covered in strange wriggling growths, and eyes, hundreds of eyes watching from the darkness. Then, as suddenly as it had begun, it was over. The procession disappeared into the mist, the whispers fading away. Cliff and I stood there for a long moment, our hearts racing. What the hell was that? Cliff whispered, his voice shaky. I shook my head, trying to clear the lingering images from my mind. I don't know, but I think we just got our first real clue about what's going on in this town. We made our way back to our room, but sleep was out of the question now. As the first light of dawn began to creep over the horizon, we sat in silence, each lost in our own thoughts. One thing was clear. Whatever was happening in Port Lock, it went far beyond a few missing divers. There was something fundamentally wrong with this place something that went against the very laws of nature. And we were right in the middle of it. The next morning dawned gray and cold, the sun a pale disk, barely visible through the thick cloud cover. Cliff and I headed down to the harbor, our minds still reeling from what we'd seen the night before. The harbor was nearly deserted, most of the boats tied up and looking like they hadn't moved in weeks. A few grizzled fishermen milled about, eyeing us suspiciously as we approached. We decided to stick to our cover story of being tourists interested in diving. It wasn't entirely a lie. We did intend to dive, just not for the reasons we were letting on. After some negotiation, we managed to charter a small boat from a reluctant owner named Bill. He was a wiry man with skin like tanned leather and eyes that had seen too much. You boys sure you want to go out there? he asked as we loaded our gear onto the boat. Ain't safe these days. We've heard the stories, I said carefully, but we're experienced divers. We'll be careful. Bill shook his head. Ain't about being careful. There's something out there, something that don't take kindly to visitors. I exchanged a glance with Cliff. What do you mean? Bill looked around nervously before leaning in close. Used to be the fishing around here was good, real good. Then, about thirty years back, something changed. Fish started coming up, wrong, deformed, sickly and the sea she started smelling foul. He paused, his eyes distant. Folks started seeing things, things that ain't natural, and people started going missing, not just divers. Fishermen, kids swimming too far out, even saw a couple of whales beach themselves, cut them open, and, well, let's just say what was inside weren't normal. A chill ran down my spine. What happened thirty years ago? Bill's face darkened. The incident... Big storm hit, worst in living memory, waves as tall as buildings. When it was over, part of the cliffs near Dead Man's Cove had collapsed, opened up some kind of underwater cave system. 
That's when things started going wrong. He shook his head as if trying to clear away the memories. You boys be careful out there, and if you see anything unusual, you turn tail and run. Don't try to be heroes. With those ominous words ringing in our ears, we set out towards Dead Man's Cove. The sea was choppy, the waves slapping against the hull of our small boat with an almost angry intensity. That foul smell was stronger out here, seeming to rise from the very water itself. As we neared the cove, I could see why it had earned its name. The cliffs rose sharply from the water, their faces scarred and pitted. At their base, jagged rocks lurked just beneath the surface, ready to tear the hull out of any boat that strayed too close. We anchored a safe distance away and began to suit up. Our diving gear was top of the line, designed to withstand extreme depths and equipped with the latest in underwater communication technology. But as I checked my equipment, I couldn't shake the feeling that it might not be enough for what we were about to face. Remember, I said to Cliff as we prepared to enter the water, we're just here to investigate. If we see anything unusual, we document it and get out. No heroics. Cliff nodded grimly. Got it. Let's hope whatever's down there is in a hospitable mood. With a final check of our gear, we slipped into the water. The cold hit me immediately, seeping through my wetsuit and chilling me to the bone. But it wasn't just the temperature that bothered me. There was something else, a strange vibration in the water that I could feel in my very bones. We descended slowly, the light from the surface fading rapidly. Our flashlights cut through the gloom, revealing a seabed that was eerily barren. No fish darted about, no crab scuttled along the sand. It was as if all life had fled this place. As we neared the base of the cliffs, I saw what must have been the cave system Bill had mentioned, a gaping maw in the rock face leading into darkness. Even from a distance, I could sense something emanating from that cave, a presence, ancient, malevolent. Cliff's voice crackled in my earpiece. You seeing this, Roland? I nodded, forgetting for a moment that he couldn't see the gesture. Yeah, whatever's going on here. I bet that cave has something to do with it. We swam closer, our lights probing the darkness. That's when I saw it. A flash of movement just at the edge of our beams. Something large, sinuous, moving with an unnatural grace. My heart began to race. Cliff, did you? I never got to finish the sentence. In that moment the thing, whatever it was, burst from the darkness. It was massive, easily the size of a school bus its body covered in slimy, iridescent scales. But it was the head that turned my blood to ice, too large, too misshapen, like something out of a nightmare. Its mouth gaped open, revealing rows upon rows of needle-sharp teeth, each one as long as my hand. Then it attacked. The creature moved with blinding speed, faster than anything that size had a right to. It struck at Cliff first, its massive body wrapping around him like a constrictor. I watched in horror as it dragged him down towards the seabed, his struggles seeming pitiful against its immense strength. Adrenaline surged through me as I swam towards them, my hand reaching for the specialized harpoon gun strapped to my leg. It was a piece of equipment we rarely used, designed for extreme situations. This certainly qualified. I took aim and fired. The harpoon struck the creature in its side, and a cloud of dark ichor billowed out into the water. The monster let out a sound that defied description part screech, part gurgle, that sent vibrations through the water and rattled my bones. Its grip on Cliff loosened, and he managed to break free, swimming towards me with powerful strokes. But the creature wasn't done. It turned its attention to me, those hollow, ancient eyes fixing on me with a hunger that was terrifyingly intelligent. Roland, move! Cliff's voice crackled in my earpiece, snapping me out of my paralysis. I barely had time to dodge as the creature lunged at me its jaws snapping shut mere inches from my face. The current from its movement sent me tumbling through the water. I struggled to right myself, my heart pounding in my ears. Cliff was at my side now, and together we began to ascend, swimming as fast as we could towards the surface. But the creature was in pursuit, its sinuous body undulating through the water with terrible efficiency. Just as I thought we might make it, I felt something wrap around my ankle. Looking down, I saw a tentacle-like appendage extending from the creature's body, pulling me back down into the depths. Panic threatened to overwhelm me as I saw the darkness below opening up to swallow me. In that moment, facing what I was sure was certain death, something inside me snapped, 
I'd faced monsters before, creatures that defied explanation, but I'd always come out on top. I wasn't about to let this overgrown eel be the end of me. With a surge of desperate strength, I twisted in the water and aimed my harpoon gun directly at the creature's eye. Time seemed to slow as I pulled the trigger. The harpoon lanced out, trailing bubbles in its wake, and struck home with a sickening squelch. The creature's scream this time was one of pain and fury. Its grip on my ankle loosened, and I wasted no time in kicking free. Cliff grabbed my arm, and together we shot towards the surface, not daring to look back. We broke the surface with a splash, gasping for air. Bill was there in the boat, his eyes wide with terror. Go, go, I yelled as we scrambled aboard. Bill didn't need to be told twice. He gunned the engine and we sped away from Dead Man's Cove, the angry royal of the water behind us the only sign of the horror we'd narrowly escaped. As we neared the harbor, I finally allowed myself to relax slightly. We'd made it. We were alive. But the relief was short-lived as I turned to check on Cliff. He was slumped against the side of the boat, his breathing labored. That's when I noticed the tears in his wetsuit and the deep, ragged gashes beneath. The creature's claws or teeth must have pierced his suit during the initial attack. Hang on, buddy, I said, applying pressure to the worst of the wounds. We'll get you patched up. Cliff managed a weak smile. Guess I'm not as spry as I used to be, he wheezed. We docked in a flurry of activity. Word of our encounter must have spread because a small crowd had gathered. Among them, I noticed several faces that looked oddly familiar. With a jolt, I realized they were some of the same people we'd seen in that eerie procession the night before. As we helped Cliff onto the dock, one of them stepped forward. It was a woman, her hair streaked with gray, her eyes holding the same unsettling glow I'd seen before. "'You've seen it, haven't you?' she asked, her voice barely above a whisper. "'The Guardian of the Deep. You're lucky to have survived.' I wanted to question her, to demand answers about what was going on in this town— but Cliff's condition was deteriorating rapidly. We needed to get him medical attention. Later, I growled, pushing past her. My friend needs help. The next few hours passed in a blur. We got Cliff to the local clinic where the doctor, a young woman who seemed oddly unsurprised by the nature of his injuries, worked to stabilize him. I paced the waiting room, my mind racing. What was that creature? How was it connected to the disappearances? And what did the locals know about it? As night fell, I found myself back at the harbor staring out at the now calm sea. The stench that had permeated the air since our arrival seemed stronger now, as if stirred up by our encounter. It wasn't always like this, you know, a voice said behind me. I turned to see the gray-haired woman from earlier. What do you mean? I asked, my hand instinctively moving to my concealed weapon. She smiled sadly. This town, these waters... They used to be clean, full of life, but then we got greedy. We took too much, pushed too far, and we woke something that should have stayed sleeping. I studied her face, noting the webbing between her fingers that I hadn't noticed before. What are you? We're what's left of Portlock's original families, she said. The ones who made the deal. Our ancestors thought they were bargaining for prosperity, endless fishing, wealth beyond measure. But the price... The price was higher than they could have imagined. She turned her gaze to the sea. The guardian you encountered? It's just a sentinel, a fraction of what lies beneath. Every generation it demands a sacrifice, and every generation we comply, hoping it will be enough. But it's never enough. It's always hungry, always growing. I felt a chill run down my spine. The missing divers. She nodded. Offerings to keep it sleeping, to buy us more time but I fear we've only delayed the inevitable. One day it will fully awaken, and when it does, she trailed off, her eyes filled with a hopeless dread. I wanted to argue to say that we could fight it, find a way to destroy it, but the memory of that ancient malevolent presence I'd sensed in the depths gave me pause. This was beyond anything I'd encountered before, beyond anything I was equipped to handle. As if reading my thoughts, the woman spoke again, you can't fight it, not directly. But maybe, maybe you can help us end this. There's a ritual, a way to seal the entrance to its domain, but it requires a willing sacrifice, someone to take the place of the unwilling victims we've been offering. I stared at her, realization dawning. You want me to? She held up a hand. Not you. 
Me. I've lived with this guilt long enough. But I need your help to perform the ritual, to ensure that this time the seal holds. I stood there for a long moment, weighing my options. Every instinct told me to grab Cliff and get as far away from this cursed town as possible. But I knew I couldn't. Whatever was down there in the depths, it wouldn't stay contained forever. And when it emerged, the consequences would be catastrophic. All right, I said finally. Tell me what I need to do. The next few days were a whirlwind of preparation. Cliff, still recovering but stable, insisted on helping despite my protests. We gathered the necessary components for the ritual, bizarre ingredients that made my skin crawl just to touch. All the while, I could feel the tension in the town building, as if the very air was aware of what we were planning. On the night of the full moon we set out once more for Dead Man's Cove. The sea was unnaturally calm, the water as smooth as glass. As we neared the site of our previous encounter, I could feel that malevolent presence stirring once more in the depths. The woman, Martha, she'd finally told us her name, began to chant in that same guttural language we'd heard during the procession. The words seemed to hang in the air, vibrating with an otherworldly power. Suddenly, the water began to churn. A whirlpool formed, growing larger by the second. At its center, I could see a faint glow emanating from beneath the waves. It's time, Martha said, her voice steady despite the fear in her eyes. She handed me a dagger, its blade inscribed with strange symbols. When I enter the whirlpool, you must complete the ritual. Spill my blood into the water and speak the words I taught you. Don't hesitate, no matter what you see or hear. I nodded, my throat too tight to speak. With a final sad smile, Martha dove into the churning water. For a moment, nothing happened. Then a scream pierced the night, a sound of such agonizing terror that it would haunt my nightmares for years to come. The water erupted and I saw it, the true form of the thing that dwelled in the depths. It was vast beyond comprehension, a writhing mass of tentacles and eyes and mouths stretching down into the blackness below. Martha's body was held aloft by one massive tentacle, her form already beginning to twist and change. Fighting against every instinct that screamed at me to flee, I plunged the dagger into my palm and let my blood drip into the water. The words of the ritual spilled from my lips, each syllable feeling like it was being torn from my very soul. The effect was immediate. The whirlpool began to collapse in on itself, dragging the monstrous form back down into the depths. Martha's body dissolved, merging with the creature as it thrashed and roared in fury. A shockwave of energy burst outward nearly capsizing our boat, and then, as suddenly as it had begun, it was over. The sea was calm once more, the only evidence of what had transpired being a faint, luminescent scar on the water's surface. We returned to Port Lock in silence, the weight of what we'd witnessed hanging heavy over us. In the days that followed, the town began to change. The strange, fish-like characteristics of the locals began to fade. The foul stench that had permeated the air dissipated. Cliff and I stayed long enough to ensure that the seal was holding, that no trace remained of the horror that had dwelled beneath the waves. But we both knew we couldn't stay. There were other mysteries out there, other horrors to face. As we packed up to leave, I took one last look out at the sea. It looked different now, cleaner, more alive. But I knew that somewhere in the darkest depths something waited, and I prayed that the seal would hold, for if it ever broke, if that ancient evil ever fully awakened, then may whatever gods exist have mercy on us all. For now, though, this case was closed. Another nightmare confronted, another secret buried. But as Cliff and I drove away from Port Lock, I couldn't shake the feeling that this was just the beginning, that somewhere out there, in the vast unknown corners of our world, other horrors waited, and sooner or later we would be called upon to face them. The life of a monster hunter is never easy, never safe. But someone has to do it. Someone has to stand against the darkness, and as long as I draw breath, that someone will be me. The diesel engine rumbled to life, a familiar vibration coursing through the cab as I settled into the worn leather seat. I'm Aaron Bishop, 38 years old, 
and for the past seven years I've called the open road my home. Trucking wasn't my first choice of career. Hell, it wasn't even on my radar until life threw me a curveball. But here I am, staring down another long night behind the wheel, the orange glow of the setting sun painting the sky ahead. I adjusted the rearview mirror, catching a glimpse of my own weathered face. The years on the road had left their mark, crow's feet creeping from the corners of my eyes, a permanent furrow etched between my brows. My beard, once neatly trimmed, now grew wild and peppered with gray. I barely recognized the man looking back at me sometimes. As I pulled out of the Harlan Transport Depot in Louisville, my mind drifted back to how I ended up here. Seven years ago, I was Aaron Bishop, husband, father, and manager at a mid-sized manufacturing plant. Life wasn't perfect, but it was steady. Then came the layoffs, the arguments, the divorce. In the span of six months, I went from having it all to sleeping on my brother's couch, drowning my sorrows in cheap whiskey. It was my brother who suggested trucking. You always liked road trips, he'd said, clapping me on the shoulder. Why not get paid for it? At the time, it seemed like a lifeline, a way to escape the mess I'd made of my life and clear my head. Now, seven years later, I couldn't imagine doing anything else. The solitude of the cab, the endless stretch of highway before me, it had become a kind of meditation. Out here I could let my mind wander without the constant noise of other people's lives. No expectations, no disappointments, just me, the road, and the steady hum of tires on asphalt. I merged onto I-64 East, the familiar route stretching out before me. My load this time was a bunch of industrial equipment bound for some backwater town in West Virginia, the kind of place you have to squint at the map to find. The dispatcher, a gruff woman named Linda with nicotine-stained fingers and a voice like gravel, had handed me the assignment like it was any other. Get it there by morning, she'd said, not looking up from her computer screen. Factory's opening and they need this stuff pronto. To me, it was just another job. Another night on the road. I had no idea what was waiting for me out there in the darkness. The first hundred miles passed in a blur of fading daylight and the gradual transition from urban sprawl to the dense, looming forests of Appalachia. I'd done this route dozens of times before, could probably drive it with my eyes closed, not that I'd ever try. The familiar landmark slipped by, the gigantic baseball bat outside the Louisville Slugger Museum, the towering horse statues marking the Kentucky Horse Park, the Florence Yall water tower that always made me chuckle. As night fell, the traffic thinned out. This was my favorite time to drive. Less chaos, cooler air, fewer distractions. Just me and the long-haul truckers, the highway cowboys, pushing through the darkness. I settled into a groove, my hands resting easy on the wheel, my eyes scanning the road ahead and the mirrors beside me out of habit. The CB radio crackled occasionally with chatter from other drivers. Warnings about speed traps, comments about the weather, the usual banter that helped break up the monotony of the night. I kept it on low, a comforting background noise that reminded me I wasn't entirely alone out here. It was around 11 p.m. when I decided to pull over at a rest stop. My eyes were starting to feel heavy, and I knew from experience that pushing through fatigue was a recipe for disaster. The exit loomed ahead, and I eased off the accelerator, guiding my rig onto the off-ramp. The rest stop was nearly deserted when I pulled in. Just one other truck a battered Peterbilt with faded paint, and a couple of beat-up sedans occupied the sprawling parking lot. The flickering lights from the bathroom facility cast an eerie glow over the cracked asphalt, creating long shadows that seemed to reach out like grasping fingers. I've seen enough truck stops to be used to the general seediness of these places, but something about this one made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Maybe it was the oppressive silence, broken only by the distant hum of the highway. Maybe it was the way the surrounding trees seemed to loom over the lot, their branches stretching out like claws against the star-studded sky. I parked my rig and killed the engine, sitting for a moment in the sudden silence. The air inside the cab felt thick, almost claustrophobic. I needed to stretch my legs to breathe in some fresh air and clear my head. As I opened the door and climbed down from the cab, the cool night air hit me like a slap to the face. It was a welcome sensation after hours in the climate-controlled bubble of my truck. I took a deep breath, feeling my muscles protest as I stretched my arms above my head. That's when I saw him. 
A man was leaning against the wall near the vending machines, half hidden in the shadows. Under normal circumstances, I wouldn't have paid him any mind. Rest stops attract all sorts of people, and I've learned it's best to keep to yourself. But there was something about the way he was staring at me that set my teeth on edge. He was tall and lanky, his clothes hanging off him like they belonged to someone twice his size. Even from a distance I could see that his face was gaunt, cheeks hollow and eyes sunken. But what really caught my attention was his mouth. It was slightly twisted, frozen in what looked like a permanent smirk or sneer. I couldn't quite tell which. As I walked towards the restroom I could feel his eyes on me, unblinking and intense. It was like being watched by a predator, sized up and evaluated. I tried to ignore him, to act casual, but every step felt like a performance under his scrutiny. When I was about ten feet away, he spoke, his voice gravelly and hoarse as if he hadn't used it in days. Need any help? he asked, the words coming out in a rasp that made me think of sandpaper on wood. I paused, caught off guard by the question. No, I'm good, I replied, trying to keep my voice steady. Just stretching my legs. His gaze didn't waver, and I felt a bead of sweat trickle down my back despite the cool night air. It was like he was trying to peer into my soul to uncover some secret hidden in the depths of my mind. Long night ahead, he said, almost to himself, his twisted mouth stretching into something that might have been a smile on anyone else. Yeah, I muttered, nodding curtly before turning towards the restroom. I didn't want to continue the conversation. Every instinct I had was screaming at me to get away from this man, to get back in my truck and drive until this place was nothing but a bad memory in my rearview mirror. Inside the restroom I splashed some water on my face, trying to shake the feeling of unease that had settled over me like a shroud. The fluorescent lights buzzed overhead, casting a sickly pallor over my reflection in the dirty mirror. I looked as unsettled as I felt, my eyes wide and darting, my forehead creased with worry. Get it together, Aaron, I muttered to myself, gripping the edges of the sink. It's just some weirdo at a rest stop. Nothing you haven't seen before. But even as I tried to reassure myself, I couldn't shake the feeling that something wasn't right. That man, with his unblinking stare and twisted smile, had gotten under my skin in a way I couldn't explain. In all my years on the road, I'd never felt this unsettled by a simple encounter. I took a deep breath, straightened up, and headed back out to my truck. The cool night air hit me again as I stepped outside, and I scanned the area, half expecting to see the strange man still lurking by the vending machines. But he was gone. The spot where he had been standing was empty, no sign that anyone had been there at all. I felt a mix of relief and unease wash over me. Part of me was glad I wouldn't have to walk past him again, but another part wondered where he had gone and why. I quickened my pace as I walked back to my truck my eyes darting around the deserted rest stop. The shadows seemed deeper now, the silence more oppressive. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, even though I couldn't see anyone around. As I climbed back into my cab, I let out a breath I didn't realize I'd been holding. I locked the doors out of habit, then paused, my hand hovering over the ignition. For a moment I considered staying put, waiting for dawn to break before continuing my journey. But the thought of sitting here all night jumping at every shadow and sound was unbearable. No, better to get back on the road, to put this strange encounter behind me and focus on the job at hand. I had a delivery to make, after all. I started the engine, the familiar rumble bringing a small measure of comfort. As I pulled out of the rest stop, I watched the flickering lights fade in my rearview mirror. The highway stretched out before me, a ribbon of black cutting through the darkness. I merged back onto the interstate, settling into the rhythm of the road. The steady hum of tires on asphalt and the gentle vibration of the engine began to calm my nerves. This was familiar territory. This I understood. As the miles ticked by, I tried to rationalize my encounter at the rest stop. Maybe the guy was just some local weirdo who got his kicks freaking out truckers. Maybe he was high on something explaining his strange behavior and appearance. Or maybe I was just more tired than I realized, my mind playing tricks on me after too many hours on the road. Whatever the explanation, I told myself it was behind me now. Just another strange story to add to my collection of road tales, nothing to worry about. If only I had known then how wrong I was. 
if only I had turned around, headed back to Louisville, and left that godforsaken route behind me. But hindsight, as they say, is twenty twentieths, and I had no way of knowing that my encounter at the rest stop was just the beginning. The real horror was still waiting for me, somewhere out there in the darkness ahead. The next hour passed in relative peace, just the steady rhythm of the tires on the road and the occasional flicker of passing headlights. I tried to focus on the job at hand, running through mental calculations of my arrival time and fuel consumption, anything to keep my mind off the unsettling encounter at the rest stop. But then, out of nowhere, my CB radio crackled to life. At first I thought nothing of it. The CB was a constant companion on long hauls, a connection to the scattered community of truckers sharing the night roads. But this wasn't the usual chatter about speed traps or weather conditions. It was static, a garbled mess of sounds that made no sense. I frowned, reaching out to adjust the dial. I usually kept it on a frequency where I'd only hear relevant chatter, so this interference was odd. As I fiddled with the controls, the static grew louder, punctuated by bursts of what sounded like distorted voices. I couldn't make out any words, just fragments of sound that sent a chill down my spine. The more I tried to clear it up, the more distorted it became, rising to a crescendo of noise that filled the cab. And then, just as suddenly as it started, it cut off, leaving the cab in silence. I sat there for a moment, my hand still on the dial, a cold sweat breaking out on my forehead. In the dim glow of the dashboard, I tried to make sense of what had just happened. Equipment malfunction? some kind of interference, or something else entirely. Before I could ponder it further, something up ahead caught my eye. Another truck, its taillights flickering like a candle in the wind. The rig was swerving slightly, its driver either distracted or drunk. Idiot, I muttered, preparing to overtake him. But as I drew closer, I felt the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. There was something familiar about that truck. The pattern of mud splattered on the trailer, the dent in the bumper. With a jolt of recognition, I realized it was the same truck I'd seen back at the rest stop. I slowed down, keeping a safe distance, my eyes scanning the cab for any sign of the driver. But the windows were dark, and I couldn't see inside. My heart began to race as I considered my options. Should I try to pass? Signal somehow? Call it in? Before I could decide, the truck suddenly jerked into my lane, forcing me to swerve onto the shoulder. My heart pounded as I fought to control the wheel, my rig skidding dangerously close to the guardrail. Adrenaline surged through me as I wrestled the truck back onto the road, my knuckles white on the steering wheel. I glanced into my side mirror expecting to see the truck barrel past me, but it was gone. Vanished as if it had never been there. I slammed on the brakes, my truck lurching to a stop on the empty highway. I looked around wildly half expecting the truck to come at me from another angle, but there was nothing. Just the dark road ahead and the looming trees on either side. For a long moment I sat there, trying to calm my breathing, to make sense of what had just happened. Maybe I'd imagined it. Maybe the long hours and the strange encounter at the rest stop were messing with my head. But the skid marks on the shoulder were real enough, stark evidence of my near miss. I needed to keep moving, to make the delivery on time but the feeling of unease didn't leave me. I kept glancing at the mirrors, half expecting that phantom truck to reappear. The minutes dragged on, each mile feeling longer than the last. The road seemed to stretch forever, disappearing into a vanishing point of darkness ahead. I tried to focus on the familiar routine of driving, on the comforting hum of the engine, but my nerves were shot. Every shadow seemed to hide a threat, every curve in the road a potential ambush. Then, about twenty miles later, my headlights caught something on the side of the road. Debris, a broken wooden crate, and an overturned motorcycle. I slowed down, squinting into the darkness. The bike was mangled, the kind of wreck you don't walk away from. Against my better judgment, I pulled over and grabbed my flashlight, stepping out into the cool night air. The beam of light danced over the twisted metal as I moved closer, and then I saw it. A body lying just off the road. Jesus, I whispered, my stomach turning. I approached cautiously, shining the light on the figure. It was a man, his limbs contorted at unnatural angles, his helmet shattered beside him. I knelt down, my hands trembling as I checked for a pulse, but I knew it was futile. The man was dead, his skin already cooling in the night air. And then I noticed something that made my blood run cold. 
the man's clothes. They were the same ones worn by the guy from the rest stop. That oversized jacket, those baggy jeans. It was him. My heart pounded in my chest as I stood up, stumbling back towards my truck. How the hell had he gotten here? How was this possible? My mind raced with questions, none of them with answers I liked. I needed to get out of here, needed to report this to the police. I fumbled for my phone, dialing 911 as I climbed back into my cab. But before I could hit send, I froze. There was someone standing in front of my truck, illuminated by the headlights. It was him, the same man staring at me with that twisted smirk on his face. No, I muttered, my hand tightening around the phone. No way. He didn't move, just stood there, as if daring me to do something. My mind screamed at me to drive, to run him over if I had to, but my body wouldn't respond. It was like I was paralyzed, locked in a staring contest with something I couldn't understand. Then, as if a switch had been flipped, he started walking towards me. His steps were slow and deliberate, each one bringing him closer to the front of my truck. I felt a scream building in my throat, but it wouldn't come out. I was trapped, like a mouse under the gaze of a cat. He reached the front of the truck and climbed up onto the hood, his face now inches from the windshield. I could see the details now. The cracked lips, the bruised skin, the way his mouth seemed to stretch impossibly wide. And then, with a single, swift motion, he slammed his hand against the glass, cracking it like a spider web. That was enough to snap me out of my trance. I slammed my foot on the gas, the engine roaring to life. The truck lurched forward, throwing him off the hood and onto the asphalt. I didn't stop to check if he was still there. I just drove, my eyes fixed on the road ahead, my mind a whirl of fear and adrenaline. The highway blurred past me as I sped through the night my hands white-knuckled on the wheel. Every shadow on the road looked like a figure about to step out in front of me. Every reflection in my mirror seemed to hide that twisted face. I didn't stop until I reached the outskirts of a small town, where I finally pulled over at a gas station. My legs were shaking as I stumbled out of the cab, the world spinning around me as the adrenaline began to wear off. Inside I found the clerk, a young guy who looked half asleep behind the counter. He perked up as I burst in, his eyes widening at what must have been a wild look on my face. You okay, man? he asked, already reaching for the phone. I didn't bother with explanations. Call the police, I gasped out. There's been an accident. A man, on the road. The clerk nodded, dialing quickly. They'll be here soon, he said, eyeing me with a mix of concern and suspicion. I nodded, leaning against the counter, my heart still racing. But as I waited, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong, that the man, or whatever he was, wasn't done with me yet. The police arrived within minutes, a pair of officers who looked like they'd seen it all. They took my statement, listening with professional skepticism as I recounted the events of the night. When I finished, the older of the two, a grizzled sergeant with salt-and-pepper hair, exchanged a look with his partner. We'll check it out, he said, his tone neutral. Why don't you stay here while we investigate? I nodded, grateful for the chance to catch my breath. As they drove off towards the scene, I paced the small convenience store, jumping at every sound. The clerk watched me warily, no doubt wondering if he should be worried about the wild-eyed trucker in his store. An hour passed before the officers returned. The look on their faces told me everything before they even spoke. We found the motorcycle, the sergeant said, his voice grave. And there was debris on the road, just like you said. But there was no body, Mr. Bishop, just some blood stains and the broken glass from your windshield. I stared at him, uncomprehending. That's... that's not possible, I stammered. He was there. I saw him. I checked for a pulse. The younger officer stepped forward, his voice gentle. Sir, have you been taking any medications or maybe had a few drinks tonight? I shook my head vehemently. No, nothing like that. I'm telling you, there was a body. The sergeant sighed, rubbing his forehead. Look, Mr. Bishop, we're not saying we don't believe you, but we can only go on what we find, and right now there's no evidence of a fatality, just a single vehicle accident and a spooked truck driver. I wanted to argue, to make them understand, but I could see in their eyes that they'd already made up their minds. To them, I was just another long-haul trucker who'd let the loneliness and monotony of the road get to him.
Get some rest, the sergeant advised, handing me his card. If you remember anything else, give us a call, and be careful out there. The roads can play tricks on a tired mind. With that, they left, leaving me alone with my thoughts and the lingering fear that clung to me like a second skin. I got back into my truck, the feeling of dread still gnawing at me. As I drove away, the town fading into the distance, I couldn't help but glance at the mirrors, half expecting to see that twisted smirk staring back at me. But there was nothing, just the empty road, stretching out ahead. And then, as if nothing had happened, the radio crackled to life again, this time with a clear signal. Some old country song, one I didn't recognize, played softly through the speakers. It was almost comforting, a slice of normalcy in a night that had been anything but. I let out a breath I didn't realize I'd been holding and kept driving. The road ahead was long and empty, but somehow less threatening now. The horrors of the night seemed to recede with each mile, fading like a bad dream in the light of dawn. But as I drove on, delivering my cargo and eventually making my way back home, I knew that this night would stay with me. The memory of that twisted face, the inexplicable events on the lonely highway, the lingering doubt about what I'd seen and experienced. It all became part of me, a story etched into my very being. In the years that followed, I'd find myself hesitating before taking night routes, especially through those winding Appalachian roads. I'd catch myself scanning rest stops for gaunt figures with unsettling smiles. And sometimes on long, lonely stretches of highway, I'd feel a chill run down my spine, as if someone or something was watching me from just beyond the reach of my headlights. But I kept driving, because that's what we do, we truckers. We face the long nights, the endless roads, and sometimes the inexplicable terrors that lurk in the darkness. We drive on, carrying our loads and our stories, always moving forward into whatever waits for us around the next bend. As for me, Aaron Bishop, I'm still out here on the roads, still hauling loads across the country, but I'm a changed man. More cautious, more aware of the thin line between the world we know and the things we can't explain. And always, always watching my mirrors, never quite sure what I might see reflecting back at me in the dead of night. Because out here on the highway, in the spaces between cities and the depths of the night, anything can happen. And sometimes the real horror isn't what's waiting for you at your destination. It's what finds you along the way. The first time I stepped into that cabin, I wasn't expecting much. It was 2012, and I had just come off a messy divorce looking for some peace. My name's Arlen Marwick, and I've always preferred the quiet anyway. But the silence I found in those Appalachian woods was something else entirely, a silence that seemed to watch and wait. I'd been a high school history teacher for 15 years, married for 12 of them. The divorce blindsided me, though looking back, I should have seen it coming. Sarah. That was my ex-wife's name. She'd grown restless, said I'd become predictable, boring. Maybe she was right. The last argument we had still echoed in my ears as I drove up the winding mountain roads, my old Subaru groaning with each steep incline. The cabin was isolated, tucked away in a part of the Appalachians that seemed to have been forgotten by time. It suited me fine. I needed the time to think, to put everything back together in my head. The drive there had been long, the kind of trip that gets your nerves wired by the time you arrive. Six hours from Richmond, the last two on roads that barely deserve the name. I'd rented the place for a month from a guy I found through some classifieds in the local paper back home. He said no one had used it for years. It's not much, he told me over the phone, his voice crackling with static, but it's good for getting away. Perfect, I thought. Getting away was exactly what I needed. As I pulled up to the cabin, the sun was already dipping below the tree line, casting long shadows across the small clearing. The cabin itself was a squat, dark shape against the deepening twilight. It looked older than I'd expected. The wood weathered to a deep gray, the roof sagging slightly in the middle. A tendril of unease curled in my stomach, but I pushed it aside. This was what I wanted, wasn't it? Isolation, quiet, a chance to reset. The key was where the owner said it would be, under a loose board on the porch. 
The lock stuck at first, reluctant to turn after who knows how long without use. When it finally gave way with a rusty groan, the door swung open to reveal darkness and the musty smell of disuse. I fumbled for a light switch, finding nothing but rough wood under my fingers. Right, the owner had mentioned something about this. No electricity. I dug out my flashlight, clicking it on and sweeping the beam across the interior. The cabin wasn't modern by any stretch, just a single room with old wooden furniture, a creaky-looking bed, and windows that looked out into a thick wall of trees. A wood-burning stove squatted in one corner, and a small kitchenette occupied another. It wasn't much, but it would do. I set about unpacking, my footsteps echoing in the empty space. Each creak of the floorboards seemed unnaturally loud in the stillness. Outside, the forest was coming alive with night sounds, the hoot of an owl, the rustle of small creatures in the underbrush. But underneath it all was a silence so profound it seemed to press against the windows, trying to find a way in. With my meager belongings put away, I cracked open a bottle of bourbon I'd brought along for company. The first sip burned going down, but the warmth that spread through me was welcome. I settled into a chair by the wood-burning stove, which I'd managed to light after some struggle. The flames cast flickering shadows on the walls, and for a moment I could almost pretend I was home. But this wasn't home. This was somewhere else entirely, somewhere old and wild. As I sat there, bourbon in hand, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. I tried to laugh it off, just my imagination running wild in a new place. But every time I glanced at the windows, all I could see was my own reflection, pale and uncertain, superimposed over the impenetrable darkness beyond. The quiet was almost unnerving. No sounds from distant highways, no planes overhead, just the wind slipping through the trees and an occasional chirp from a night bird. I felt something I hadn't felt in a long time. Alone. Truly alone. As the night wore on and the bourbon bottle grew lighter, that feeling of solitude began to shift. What had started as a relief, an escape from the chaos of my collapsing marriage, was turning into something else, something heavier, more oppressive. The silence outside seemed to seep into the cabin, filling every corner, every crevice. I tried to distract myself, leafing through some old books I'd found on a shelf, local history mostly, tales of settlers and long-forgotten skirmishes. But my mind kept wandering, imagining what might be out there in the darkness, just beyond the reach of my vision. It was well past midnight when I finally crawled into bed, the bourbon having done its job in making me drowsy. The bed creaked ominously under my weight, but it was surprisingly comfortable. As I lay there, staring up at the shadowy ceiling, I tried to focus on the positives. This was a new start, a chance to clear my head and figure out what came next. But as I drifted off to sleep, one last thought floated through my mind. In all that silence, in all that darkness, how would I ever hear something coming? I woke with a start, disoriented in the pitch darkness. For a moment I couldn't remember where I was. The unfamiliar creaks and groans of the cabin brought it all rushing back. The divorce, the long drive, the isolation I'd sought out. I fumbled for my phone on the rickety bedside table, squinting at the harsh light of the screen. 3.17 a.m. As my eyes adjusted to the darkness, I became aware of a sound. At first I thought it might have been a branch breaking off one of the trees, or maybe some wildlife rummaging around outside. I tried not to think much of it. But then I heard it again, a kind of snapping like someone stepping on dry twigs, but heavier, too heavy for a raccoon or a fox. I sat up in bed, listening carefully. The rational side of me tried to explain it away. Maybe a bear, I thought, or a deer wandering too close. But there was something deliberate about the sound, almost like someone, or something, was moving just outside the cabin. My heart began to race and I could feel sweat beating on my forehead despite the chill in the air. I got up, my bare feet recoiling from the cold wooden floor. I slipped on my boots, not bothering to lace them, and grabbed the flashlight from the kitchen drawer where I'd left it. The beam of light seemed feeble against the darkness as I approached the window. I hesitated for a moment before pulling back the thin curtain. The glass reflected my own pale face back at me, eyes wide with a mix of fear and curiosity. Beyond my reflection the night pressed close, the trees mere silhouettes against a sky devoid of stars. 
I stood there for what felt like hours, straining my eyes and ears for any sign of movement. Just as I was about to convince myself it had been nothing, I saw it. A shadow, darker than the night around it, moved at the edge of the clearing. It was big, whatever it was, and it moved with a fluid grace that sent a shiver down my spine. My breath caught in my throat. I wanted to look away, to crawl back into bed and pull the covers over my head like a child. But I couldn't tear my eyes from the window. The shadow paused, and for a heart-stopping moment I could have sworn it turned to look directly at me. Then, as quickly as it had appeared, it was gone, melting back into the tree line. I stumbled back from the window, my mind racing. What had I just seen? A bear? A trick of the light? Or something else entirely? I tried to rationalize it, to find some explanation that didn't send my imagination spinning into terrifying possibilities. But the image of that shadow, so dark and so wrong, somehow stayed with me. Sleep was out of the question now. I built up the fire in the wood stove, grateful for its warmth and light. As I sat there nursing a cup of instant coffee I'd thought to pack, I couldn't shake the feeling that something had changed. The cabin, which had felt like a sanctuary just hours before, now seemed fragile, its walls too thin, its windows too numerous. As the first pale light of dawn began to seep into the sky, I made a decision. I needed to know more about this place, about the woods surrounding it. The owner had mentioned a small town about twenty miles down the mountain. Surely someone there would know something about the local wildlife, about any dangers a city dweller like myself should be aware of. I dressed quickly, eager to be out in the daylight, but as I opened the cabin door I froze. There, in the soft dirt just beyond the porch, was a single footprint. It was large, larger than any human foot with long, claw-like impressions at the ends of the toes, and it was fresh. I stared at it, my mind refusing to process what I was seeing. It couldn't be real. It had to be some kind of joke or a mistake or anything but what it looked like, because what it looked like was something that shouldn't exist. I all but ran to my car, the gravel crunching loudly under my feet. As I drove down the winding road, faster than was safe, I kept glancing in my rearview mirror. The cabin receded into the distance, swallowed up by the trees. But I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, that something was following me, keeping pace just out of sight. The town, when I finally reached it, was a welcome sight. A handful of buildings clustered around a main street, with a diner that looked like it hadn't changed since the 1950s. I parked in front of it my hands shaking slightly as I turned off the engine. Inside, the diner was warm and smelled of coffee and bacon. A few locals looked up as I entered, their conversations pausing briefly before resuming. I made my way to the counter where an older woman with graying hair pulled back in a tight bun regarded me with a mixture of curiosity and wariness. Coffee? she asked, already reaching for a mug. I nodded, gratefully wrapping my hands around the steaming cup she placed in front of me. I took a sip, savoring the bitter warmth before speaking. I'm staying up in a cabin in the woods, I began, trying to keep my voice casual, about twenty miles up the mountain. I was wondering, are there any large animals I should be aware of? Bears, maybe? The woman's expression changed, just slightly, but enough for me to notice. She glanced at an older man sitting at the end of the counter, who had looked up at my question. Bears, sure, she said slowly but they don't usually bother nobody if you leave them be. She paused, seeming to choose her next words carefully. Where exactly did you say this cabin was? I described its location as best I could. With each word, the atmosphere in the diner seemed to grow heavier. The conversations around me had died down, and I could feel eyes on my back. The older man at the end of the counter cleared his throat. That old Erickson place? he asked, his voice gruff. When I nodded, he exchanged a look with the woman behind the counter. Listen, son, he said, turning to face me fully. Those woods, they're old, older than any of us. And sometimes, in old places like that, there are things that are best left alone. A chill ran down my spine that had nothing to do with the temperature. What do you mean? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. The man opened his mouth to respond, but the woman behind the counter cut him off with a sharp look. He doesn't mean anything by it, she said, her tone forcefully cheerful. Just that it's easy for city folk to get turned around in those woods. 
You be careful up there, you hear? I nodded, but I could tell there was more they weren't saying. As I finished my coffee and prepared to leave, the old man caught my eye one last time. If I were you, he said quietly, I'd find somewhere else to stay. As I drove back up the mountain, his words echoed in my mind. The trees seemed to press closer to the road, their branches reaching out like grasping fingers. I tried to tell myself I was being ridiculous, that there was a perfectly rational explanation for everything I'd seen and heard. But as the cabin came into view, looking small and vulnerable against the vast expanse of the forest, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was driving back into something ancient and dangerous, something that had been waiting a very long time for someone like me to stumble into its domain. The drive back to the cabin was tense, every shadow among the trees seeming to hide some unknowable threat. I couldn't shake the cryptic warning from the old man at the diner. What did he know that he wasn't telling me? As I approached the cabin, I noticed something odd. The door was ajar, swinging gently in the breeze. I was certain I'd locked it before leaving. My heart raced as I cautiously approached, half expecting to find the place ransacked. But inside, everything was as I'd left it. Almost. On the small desk in the corner where I'd left the local history books I'd been perusing, there was now a leather-bound journal I didn't recognize. Its pages were yellowed with age, the binding cracked and worn. With trembling hands, I opened it. The journal belonged to a man named Theodore Erickson, dated 1887. As I read, a chill settled deep in my bones. Erickson wrote of coming to these mountains to study local folklore, particularly legends of a creature that stalked the forests. The locals called it the Watcher in the Woods, a being as old as the mountains themselves. Erickson's entries grew more frantic as the journal progressed. He wrote of hearing strange noises at night, of glimpsing a tall, shadowy figure at the edge of the clearing. In his final entry, the handwriting barely legible, he mentioned a cave system deep in the woods where he believed the creature dwelled. I closed the journal, my mind reeling. How had this gotten here? And more importantly, was it real? Part of me wanted to dismiss it as an elaborate hoax, but the footprint I'd seen earlier gnawed at my skepticism. That night, the sounds outside grew bolder. The snapping of twigs and rustling of leaves seemed to circle the cabin endlessly. I huddled by the wood stove, the journal clutched to my chest, straining my ears for any sign of approach. Then suddenly silence fell, a silence so complete it seemed to press against my eardrums. Slowly I approached the window, peering out into the darkness. There it stood, at the edge of the clearing, tall, impossibly tall, with limbs too long and joints that bent in ways that made my stomach churn. Its body was covered in thick, matted fur, and its face, God, its face, where eyes should have been, there were only dark, empty sockets, yet I could feel its gaze boring into me. I stumbled back, knocking over a chair in my haste. The creature moved then with a speed that defied its size, rushing towards the cabin. The door shook violently under its assault, the wood splintering. In a panic, I grabbed the hunting knife I'd found earlier and braced myself. But the door held. After what seemed like an eternity, the pounding stopped. When I finally found the courage to look outside again, the creature was gone, leaving only deep claw marks in the door as evidence of its visit. I didn't sleep that night. As soon as the first light of dawn broke, I was in my car, the journal beside me, heading down the mountain. I drove straight to the local sheriff's office, my story spilling out in a rush. The sheriff, a weathered man named Hank Tanner, listened with a grim expression. When I finished, he sighed heavily. Mr. Marwick, he said, we get stories like that from time to time. Not a lot of folks come back from that cabin, least not the same as they went in. He wouldn't elaborate further, but he didn't dismiss me outright. Instead, he asked to see the journal. As he flipped through its pages, his frown deepened. This shouldn't be here, he muttered almost to himself. What do you mean? I asked. The sheriff fixed me with a hard stare. This journal was evidence in a missing persons case, from 1887. It's supposed to be locked up in county records. A cold dread settled in my stomach. Then how? He shook his head. I don't know, but I'll tell you this. Whatever's out there, it's not for us to understand. It's something old, older than these woods. My advice? 
Get as far away from here as you can and don't look back. I didn't need to be told twice. I left town that day driving until the mountains were just a memory on the horizon. I never returned to the cabin, never tried to reclaim the belongings I'd left behind in my haste to escape. But sometimes in the dead of night I still hear it. The snapping of twigs, the rustling of leaves, and in my dreams I see those empty, staring sockets, feel that ancient, inhuman gaze upon me. I don't know what it was that I encountered in those Appalachian woods, some kind of creature, something that doesn't belong in this world. But I know this, it's still out there, waiting, watching, and God help the next person who stumbles into its domain. Years have passed since my experience in the Appalachian cabin. I've tried to move on, to forget the terror of those nights. But the memories linger, as does the feeling that I glimpsed something beyond the veil of our everyday world. I've done research since then, discreetly. I've found whispers of similar encounters scattered throughout history, tales of a creature that stalks the ancient forests of the world. Some call it a guardian, others a monster. But always it's described with a sense of awe and terror. I've never shared my story publicly before. Who would believe me? But recently, I've started to worry. There are more people venturing into the wilderness these days, seeking the same solitude I once did. And I can't help but wonder how many of them might unknowingly wander into that creature's territory. So I'm breaking my silence now, not to seek validation or attention, but as a warning. To those who might be drawn to the quiet of the deep woods, to the isolation of forgotten places, be careful. There are things in this world older and stranger than we can imagine. And sometimes the silence you hear isn't emptiness, but something holding its breath, waiting. As for me, I've found my peace, but it's a guarded one. I live in the city now, surrounded by the comforting noise of civilization. But every so often I'll catch a glimpse of something tall and shadowy out of the corner of my eye, or hear a twig snap in a park at night, and for a moment I'm back in those woods. And I remember that no matter how far I run, no matter how brightly lit and populated my surroundings, a part of me will always be there, in that cabin, watching the darkness and feeling it watch me back. The first time I stepped into that cabin, I wasn't expecting much. It was 2012, and I had just come off a messy divorce looking for some peace. My name's Arlen Marwick, and I've always preferred the quiet anyway. I'd spent the last 15 years as a high school history teacher in suburban Pittsburgh, married to a woman I thought I'd grow old with. But life has a way of upending your plans. Karen and I had drifted apart, our conversations becoming shorter, our silence is longer. When she told me she'd met someone else, it felt like a formality more than a shock. The cabin was isolated, tucked away in the Appalachian wilderness of West Virginia, which suited me fine. I needed time to think, to put everything back together in my head. The drive there had been long, the kind of trip that gets your nerves wired by the time you arrive. I'd left Pittsburgh early in the morning, watching the cityscape give way to rolling hills, and then to the rugged terrain of the Appalachians. I'd rented the place for a month from a guy I found through some classifieds. Walt, he called himself. Gruff voice, few words. He said no one had used the cabin for years. It's not much, he told me over the phone, but it's good for getting away. Perfect, I thought. As I navigated the narrow, winding roads, the trees pressed in closer, their branches forming a canopy that filtered the late afternoon sunlight. The GPS signal had died about 20 miles back, leaving me to rely on Walt's hand-drawn map. Just when I thought I'd made a wrong turn, I saw it. A small clearing where the trees parted just enough to reveal a weathered wooden structure. The cabin stood there, looking as if it had grown out of the forest floor itself. Its log walls were darkened with age, the small porch sagging slightly under the weight of years. A thin wisp of smoke curled from the stone chimney. Walt had mentioned he'd go ahead and start a fire for me. I parked my old Subaru and stepped out, the gravel crunching under my feet. The air was different here, crisp, laden with the scent of pine and damp earth. For the first time in months, 
I felt my shoulders relax, the constant tension that had become my companion starting to ebb away. Grabbing my duffel bag from the trunk, I made my way to the cabin. The porch creaked under my weight, the sound startlingly loud in the quiet of the forest. I found the key where Walt said it would be, under a rust-spotted tin can on the windowsill. The door opened with a groan, revealing a single room that would be my home for the next month. It wasn't much, just as Walt had said. A bed tucked in one corner, its iron frame speaking of a different era. A small kitchenette lined one wall, with a propane stove and an icebox that had probably been state-of-the-art when Eisenhower was president. In the center, a pot-bellied wood stove radiated warmth, its flickering light casting dancing shadows on the walls. It had a musty smell, but I didn't mind it. I figured it was just old wood and the wilderness creeping in. The quiet was almost unnerving, though. No sounds from distant highways, no planes overhead, just the wind slipping through the trees and an occasional chirp from a bird. I set my bag down and walked to the window, looking out at the thick wall of trees that surrounded the clearing. As the last light of day faded, the forest seemed to press closer, as if curious about its new inhabitant. I felt something I hadn't felt in a long time. Alone. Truly alone. Little did I know, as I stood there watching darkness settle over the Appalachian wilderness, that this sense of solitude would soon be shattered. In the coming days I would question everything I thought I knew about the world, about reality itself. But in that moment, watching the first stars appear in the darkening sky, I felt a glimmer of hope. Maybe here, in this isolated cabin, I could finally find the peace I'd been searching for, how wrong I was. That first night I unpacked, cracked open a bottle of bourbon I'd brought along, and settled in by the wood-burning stove. The bourbon burned going down, but it helped quiet the thoughts that had been chasing each other around my head for months. What would I do now? Go back to teaching? Move to a new city? The questions that had seemed so urgent back in Pittsburgh felt distant here, muffled by the thick forest surrounding me. As the night deepened, the sounds of the forest changed. The cheerful chirping of daytime birds gave way to the low mournful call of an owl. Something small scurried across the cabin's roof, a squirrel maybe, or a raccoon. I told myself I'd need to get used to these noises. After fifteen years of suburban living, the sounds of true wilderness were foreign to me. I must have dozed off in the chair because I woke with a start, disoriented. The fire had died down to embers, casting a dull red glow across the room. Outside the moon had risen its light filtering through the trees and creating strange shifting shadows on the cabin floor. That's when I heard it for the first time. A sound so faint I wasn't sure if I'd actually heard it or if it was just my mind playing tricks on me. A snap like a dry twig breaking underfoot. I held my breath, straining to listen. For a long moment there was nothing but silence. Then there it was again. Closer this time. I rose from the chair, my heart beginning to race. Probably just a deer, I told myself, or maybe a bear. I knew black bears were common in these parts. Still I found myself moving quietly, not wanting to draw attention to myself. I crept to the window, peering out into the moonlit clearing. At first I saw nothing but trees and shadows. Then a movement caught my eye. Just at the edge of the clearing something shifted. It was too dark to make out clearly, but I had the impression of something large moving with surprising grace between the trees. I blinked, and it was gone. Shaking my head, I stepped back from the window. My mind was obviously playing tricks on me, fueled by bourbon and an unfamiliar environment. I decided to call it a night, crawling into the creaky bed and pulling the musty blankets up to my chin. Sleep didn't come easily. Every sound, the settling of the cabin's old logs, the wind rustling through the trees set me on edge. When I finally drifted off, my dreams were uneasy, filled with shadowy figures always just out of sight. The next morning I woke to sunlight streaming through the windows. The strange sounds and shadows of the night before seemed silly in the bright light of day. I made a pot of coffee on the old stove and stepped out onto the porch, breathing in the crisp morning air. The forest looked different in daylight, less menacing, more alive, Birds flitted between the branches, and a squirrel chattered angrily at me from a nearby tree. I sipped my coffee, feeling foolish about my fears the night before. 
After breakfast I decided to explore the area around the cabin. Walt's hand-drawn map showed a small creek not far away, and I thought a walk might do me good. I pulled on my hiking boots, grabbed a water bottle, and set out. The forest was dense, the undergrowth thick with ferns and mountain laurel. I picked my way carefully along what seemed to be an old, overgrown trail. The creek, when I found it, was beautiful, clear water bubbling over moss-covered rocks. I sat on a fallen log, listening to the water and the bird song, feeling more at peace than I had in months. That's when I noticed the silence. It fell suddenly, as if someone had flipped a switch. The bird song stopped, the breeze died, even the creek seemed to quiet. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up. Something felt wrong. I stood slowly, looking around. The forest suddenly seemed darker, the shadows deeper. A twig snapped somewhere behind me and I whirled around. Nothing. But I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. Heart pounding, I started back toward the cabin, moving as quickly as I dared through the undergrowth. Twice I thought I heard something moving parallel to me, just out of sight. But each time I stopped to look I saw nothing but trees and shadows. I burst out of the forest into the cabin's clearing, relief flooding through me at the sight of the weathered structure. As I reached the porch, I couldn't help but look back. For a moment, just a moment, I thought I saw something. A shadow, darker than the others, moving at the edge of the trees. But when I blinked, it was gone. Inside the cabin, I locked the door behind me, my hands shaking slightly. I tried to laugh it off. I was a grown man, for God's sake, spooked by shadows and silence. But a part of me knew that what I'd felt out there was real. Something had been watching me, following me. As the day wore on, I tried to put the incident out of my mind. I busied myself with small tasks, chopping more firewood, organizing my meager supplies. But I couldn't shake the feeling of unease that had settled over me. That night, as darkness fell, I found myself constantly glancing out the windows, searching the tree line for any sign of movement. The bourbon didn't help as much as it had the night before. Every sound from the forest set my nerves on edge. I was just about to turn in for the night when I heard it. A long, low sound. Not quite a howl, not quite a moan. It echoed through the trees, setting the hairs on my arms standing on end. It didn't sound like any animal I'd ever heard. And it sounded close. Standing there in the darkened cabin, listening to that unearthly sound, I realized something that chilled me to my core. I was utterly, completely alone out here, miles from the nearest person. And if something was out there, something that didn't want me here, there was no one to help me. That was the moment I first thought about leaving. But something kept me there. Stubbornness, curiosity, or maybe just the fear of driving those dark, winding roads at night. So I stayed, huddled in bed, listening to the forest and wondering what was out there, watching and waiting in the darkness. Little did I know this was just the beginning. The true horrors of that Appalachian hollow were yet to reveal themselves, and I was about to be caught right in the middle of something I couldn't begin to understand. The next few days passed in a blur of anxiety and sleepless nights. I tried to convince myself that what I'd heard and seen were just products of an overactive imagination, stressed by recent life changes and an unfamiliar environment. But deep down, I knew better. On my fourth day at the cabin, I decided I needed supplies and maybe some human interaction to calm my nerves. I drove into the nearest town, a small place called Millhaven, about thirty miles away. As I walked into the general store, the bell above the door jangled, and a few curious faces turned to look at me. The store owner, a weathered man in his sixties, regarded me with a mix of curiosity and wariness. You must be staying up at the old Crowley place, he said. It wasn't a question. I nodded, surprised. How did you know? He shrugged. Not many strangers come through here, fewer still head up that way. He paused, seeming to consider his next words carefully. How are you finding it up there? Something in his tone made me hesitate. It's quiet, I said finally. He nodded slowly. That it is, quieter than most places. He busied himself with restocking a shelf, but I could tell he wanted to say more. Is there something I should know about the place? I asked, trying to keep my voice casual. The old man sighed. Look, mister, I don't want to scare you or nothing. But that hollow where the cabin sits, it's got a history. Things happen up there sometimes. 
Things folks can't explain. A chill ran down my spine. What kind of things? He shook his head. Just keep your wits about you, all right? And maybe don't go wandering in the woods after dark. I left the store with more questions than answers and a growing sense of unease. As I drove back to the cabin, the forest seemed to press in closer, the shadows deeper and more menacing. That night, the sounds outside the cabin intensified, the snapping of twigs, the rustling in the underbrush. It was as if something was circling the cabin, testing its boundaries. I sat up all night, knife in hand, jumping at every sound. As dawn broke, I made a decision. I couldn't stay here. Whatever was out there, whatever was happening, it was beyond my understanding. I started packing my things, determined to leave as soon as possible. But as I was loading my car, I heard a sound that made my blood run cold. A scream. Human, but barely. It came from deep in the forest, filled with terror and pain. Without thinking, I grabbed my flashlight and the knife and plunged into the woods. I ran blindly, branches whipping at my face, the scream guiding me deeper into the forest. I burst into a small clearing and stopped dead in my tracks. There, in the center of the clearing, was a sight that defied explanation. A creature stood there, hunched over something on the ground. It was tall, impossibly tall, with limbs too long and a body covered in matted fur. As it turned to look at me, I saw its face, or rather the lack of one, just a smooth, featureless expanse where a face should be, with a wolf-like snout protruding grotesquely. For a moment we stood frozen regarding each other, then it moved, faster than anything that size should be able to. I turned and ran, crashing through the underbrush, my heart pounding in my ears. I could hear it behind me, gaining ground with every second. I burst out of the tree line, the cabin in sight. With a final burst of speed I reached the porch, fumbling with the key. As I slammed the door shut behind me, something heavy crashed against it. The wood groaned under the impact. For hours the thing circled the cabin, testing the doors and windows. I huddled in the center of the room, knife clutched in my shaking hands, certain that at any moment the walls would give way and the creature would be upon me. But as suddenly as it had begun, the assault stopped. The forest fell silent. I waited, barely breathing, for what felt like hours. Finally, as the first light of dawn crept through the windows, I gathered the courage to look outside. The clearing was empty, but there, at the edge of the forest, I saw it. The creature stood watching me, its eyeless face somehow conveying a sense of patient malevolence. As I watched, it turned and melted into the shadows of the trees. I didn't wait another moment. I threw my belongings into the car and drove away, tires skidding on the gravel road. I didn't stop driving until I was back in Pittsburgh, the familiar cityscape a welcome sight after the horrors of the forest. In the years since, I've tried to make sense of what happened in those Appalachian woods. I've researched local legends, spoken to cryptozoologists, even considered the possibility of some government experiment gone wrong. But in the end, I'm left with more questions than answers. Sometimes, on quiet nights, I find myself looking out my window towards the west, towards those distant mountains. And I wonder if it's still out there, that eyeless, faceless thing, waiting in the darkness of the forest, waiting for the next unsuspecting soul to stumble into its domain. I never returned to that cabin. But I know this. There are things in this world beyond our understanding, things that lurk in the shadows of forgotten places. And sometimes, if we're not careful, we might just catch a glimpse of them. So if you're ever driving through the Appalachians and you see a small road leading off into the woods, my advice is this. Keep driving. Some places are best left undisturbed, some mysteries best left unsolved. Because once you've seen what lurks in the darkness, you can never unsee it. And it never, ever forgets you. I work as a lab tech in a water treatment plant. It's a modest place with facilities that are a bit run down, but still in high functionality. We're placed on a back road near a state park, our source of water being the large lake nearby. For the most part, it's calm back here. We regularly have uniform and chemical deliveries, so there's a semi-frequent buzz of human traffic. 
Plus, with the state park being so close, we see a lot of bicyclers, trail runners, and horse riders just beyond the fence line. While there is only a singular tree on the actual property, this is to prevent the tree roots from leaching water from the many pipes beneath the grounds. Our facility is close to the woods and boasts a fun collective of local wildlife. The most interesting aspect of our location, though, is the Pioneer Cemetery out front. It's a small thing, totaling less than 100 visible graves. Most of the stones have been worn down by weather and lichen, but the visible dates places most of them in the late 1700s and early 1800s. There has been a local effort to document and preserve what we can, but the effects of time are working against what is left. It makes me feel a bit sad, if I'm honest. These were some of the oldest settlers in the local area. It's a shame that their physical plots and gravestone etchings may just be lost to time. I can't help but wonder if that sort of thing is what drives any lingering spirits out of the place. Maybe they're upset about being forgotten, too. I say this because, despite the calmness and relative peace of the water plant, sometimes weird and inexplicable things happen. I mentioned previously that we have regular people traffic, but that's only true part of the time. I think the most people I have seen gathered on site at once was when we hosted a seminar. Otherwise, when we're fully staffed, there's usually about three of us on the premises at the same time. On weekends, when the operators work 12-hour shifts, though, it's usually two of us. As of late, we've been working with a skeleton crew, so our active worker number is usually just two of us, myself and one of the plant operators. I bring it up because that is one of the ways I have come to know that this activity is not some kind of ongoing prank from my co-workers. All but one other are men, and I am a woman who is rather easy to startle. They take some enjoyment in scaring me from time to time. I have always believed in the paranormal and supernatural. I've seen and heard ghosts since I was a child, and had some experiences in nature that I cannot explain. Even so, it's always a bit of a shock when I see or hear things firsthand. I just hadn't anticipated experiencing activity at my place of work, you know. Just this year, there has been an increasing amount of activity that I don't wish to leave undocumented any longer. Being a water plant, there's a surplus of residual noise. Pumps working, water draining and dripping, alarms going off, and footsteps of operators going about their usual routines. I have grown used to these noises and am able to recognize when my mind is matrixing the distant drip of water into quiet voices. Sometimes the sounds I hear are far different, knocking on the walls or on the other side of a glass door that I can plainly see through, humming and singing of old church hymns when walking through the pipe or filter galleries, full-on conversations in the stairwells between two voices I do not recognize. I only work with ten other people. I know their voices. These are different and unfamiliar. Every once in a while I'll see movement in my peripherals, something just fast enough for me to notice, and then miss if I turn my head. There's never anything distinguishable about the figures. I'm only left with the lingering feeling that someone or something was there, as proof that I saw anything at all. The only thing I noticed as being different from all other activity was the intense feeling of being watched in the basement level. It didn't happen every time I went down there. It was more of a 50 50th chance I'd feel anything down there. But those times that I did, it was a heavy sensation, like I was being visually dissected while I was there. So while there has been minor activity, it has generally been nothing more than what I could classify as background noise, something you might not even notice if you're not paying attention, or something you wouldn't pick up on if not in tune with your instincts. That was until a couple of weeks ago when I had a day that changed just the entire status quo of established ghostly activity. It had been one of those two-man crew days, only myself in the lab and one of the operators there to oversee everything else. Things were quiet as the both of us were tired and opting to go about our days rather than strike up conversation. I had to go and fetch a couple of samples in the basement from a location we called the CFE, which stands for Combined Filter Effluent. I mentioned my plans as a quick check into my co-worker, a safety protocol since cellular service is non-existent down there, and then began traversing the plant to get to the basement. The pipe gallery which housed the CFE is only accessible via two stairwells at either end, both of which are a solid two or three steep flights. The length of this chamber is about half a football field and is not a quick crossing to make. 
It sits beneath the filter gallery and has a vaulted ceiling that is about two stories tall, which means that the acoustics in there are always strange and have me on edge, especially when the constant dripping of water sounds more like unknown voices coming from the other end of the area. My usual approach to the CFE means I come in one end of the gallery and exit on the other. This is partly due to the location of the sample site versus the lab. It just makes more sense to take this path. But it's also due to my paranoia that I'm going to see someone else down there. The way I do it, I get to do a visual sweep of the whole room before I go about grabbing my sample, thus turning my back on the rest of the gallery. I went about my usual routine, humming a song as I strode down the stairs, and doing visual checks for anything odd that I might need to bring up to the operator. It had felt like a normal trip down, no unseen watching eyes nor thick feeling in the air. I plopped one of my sample bottles beneath the CFE tap and dragged out my phone to take a picture of the turbidity displayed on one of the machines nearby. All was normal. And then a hand clapped over my left shoulder, the fingers cold to the touch. A deep voice that I didn't recognize said, CFE, huh? Whoever it was had been close enough that I could feel breath on my neck as they said it. I was frozen for a moment before I whipped around. There was no one. A shiver went down my spine as I frantically scanned the chamber for any signs that my co-worker had followed me down. I ran over to the nearest stairwell and looked up to see if he was trying to skitter away. But I knew he couldn't be. There had been no sound of footsteps leading up to the encounter. No shuffle of fabric. No tap of shoes on the cement floors or metal grates. Nothing. While it hadn't been scary, it was startling to have this physical incident with no person nearby. It took me a minute to process that I hadn't known the voice. There had been a country twang to the words that none of my co-workers had. I crouched down to calm my breathing, intent on finishing my sampling before I left the area. Though a part of me just wanted to bolt back upstairs to my co-worker, away from whatever had just interacted with me. I snatched up my bottle as soon as it was filled and opted to head back to the far stairwell. I knew there was no way someone could have gotten away so quick in such a large room, but my paranoid brain demanded I check anyways. As I turned to head up the stairs, I heard it. Footsteps. For a second I was relieved. Perhaps it was my co-worker, after all, and he had decided to reveal himself after my scare. Then I actually looked down the length of the gallery where the footsteps were approaching from and saw nothing. Then that same deep voice called out, Come back. My heart picked up in my chest as I pushed myself up those stairs two at a time. I had no idea what this invisible entity wanted, and I wasn't sticking around to find out. I ran down the hallway of the next level and straight into the stairwell that would take me back to the top level of the plant, only thinking to get away from the basement as quickly as possible. As I burst into the hallway that led to the lab, I stopped when I realized there was a conversation happening in the control room. I stuttered to a halt and stared into the area. The control room was closed off by two large windows and two doors that were half-window as well. I could clearly see there was no one in there. My mind was still whirring from the incident in the basement, and this was not helping the panic die down. I pushed the door open, and the sound silenced. As a desperate effort to find something that might offer explanation, I woke up all the computers and searched for an open Internet browser. I thought that maybe something on there was playing sound. Nothing. I left the room just as quickly and darted back into the lab. My co-worker Jay was still there running tests, just as I'd left him. He noticed my frantic breathing and looked up with a worried expression. You okay, eh? he asked. I didn't even know what to say. I put my hands on the lab countertops as a way to ground myself and tried to get control of my breath. You've been in here since I went down, right? I questioned once I had calmed somewhat. Yes? I was doing the 10 a.m. tests, like I told you. I laughed, a bit incredulous. Jay is a large man with notoriously harsh asthma, which is to say that he and Stairs are not friends. As I looked at him, I registered the fact that his breathing pattern was normal and unhindered. There was no way it had been him, which left the question of who it had been. I'm still not sure what to decide about it. If I think about the incident in hindsight, there wasn't really anything scary or malevolent about the voice nor the energy involved. It had almost been like interacting with one of my co-workers as we went about our days. But since I startle as easily as I do, it had freaked me out. 
I kept the incident to myself until I found a time to corner the only other woman on staff, my work mom M, and told her about it. To my surprise, she was quick to tell me she had experienced something similar in almost the exact same spot about six months ago. M also informed me that she has been seeing these spirits for years. She is the third shift supervisor, often working solo as she is one of two operators on that schedule, so most of her nights she is the only one on site. M told me that over the years she has worked here, she has seen wispy forms moving throughout and from the Pioneer Cemetery up front. They walk right through the chain-link fencing that surrounds the facility and disappear like mist under the sun. M also proceeded to corroborate a lot of my other notes of activity, from the sounds I'd been hearing all the way to the feeling of being watched in the basement. I'm still blown away by this revelation. I thought it had just been me experiencing these things. As all of the guys dismissed my claims as my mind playing tricks on me. But now I have confirmation that this ongoing activity is nothing new. I have only been in this job for about two years. My work mom has been here for thirty years. I can't even imagine how much she has experienced in that time. I'm kind of curious to learn more even though my heart rate still skyrockets as I go down those stairs. To M and I these spirits are very real and active, and now I know that they originate in the cemetery. Their graves silent and dark while their restless presences manifest within the water plant's walls. The incident is fresh in my mind still, as clear as the day it happened. I struggle to convince myself to go down into that pipe gallery basement. As open-minded as I am to the supernatural, I don't necessarily want first-hand experience. I could go without it, actually. So I guess this entry can serve as my attempt to find peace of mind after such a startling encounter. Spirits of the cemetery, I will listen for your voices, but I don't need physical contact to know you're there. Please let me keep it this way.